Assessment Program, or REMAP. Um, I think as many of you know, EPA has been assessing water quality and the health of Everglades and Big Cypress since about the 1990s. Um, and this REMAP program, um, through it, we've completed nine sampling events, most recently in 2014, and sampled over um, 1,000 locations. This has been a real collaborative effort with over 30 uh, partner organizations, uh, many of them, of course, represented um, on the, in this meeting today. So I'm pleased to announce that EPA is in the planning stages for another remap uh, sampling event in October of 2023. Uh, we plan to sample about 170 uh, marsh locations throughout the Everglades and Big Cypress. Um, and I want to just extend a big thank you to the National Park Service for their uh, both logistical support and funding assistance, as well as to other state and federal uh, partners who sent letters of support for this project. Um, so thank you for that and excited for, um, for this next round of sampling. I also wanted to give an update on uh, funding from EPA to support uh, 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 restoration work in South Florida. Um, as many of you know, uh, one of our geo programs, geographic programs has uh, in, in South Florida has funded um, uh, work in both the Everglades watershed and coastal waters for about 30 years. Last year, EPA awarded about $6 million in grants to state and local government agencies, universities, nonprofit organizations to support water quality monitoring and modeling, um, research around coral, seagrass, and emerging contaminants, uh, a, a range of nutrient reduction activities to mitigate um, harmful algal blooms. And um, many of these ongoing projects are in um, the Florida Keys, Biscayne Bay, uh, Florida Bay, and, and you know, other estuaries and watersheds. We are excited because right now we're in the process of uh, preparing for the next South Florida uh, request for proposals, um, and it should be posted on grants.gov in the next uh, few months. We'll be providing uh, approximately $8 million in South Florida funding through grants. Uh, this includes an additional $3.2 million in funding uh, through the bipartisan infrastructure law. So we're really thrilled that um, over the next five years, because of uh, President Biden's vision and leadership and bipartisan congressional action, um, we will be able to um, um, really increase the base funding through the South Florida GEO program. So really exciting uh, to, to, that that's going to be the case and also how um, those additional resources can really accelerate the great uh, partnerships that we're talking about today. Um, that South Florida funding um, is going to be able to support things like nature-based solutions to improve coastal resiliency, restoring coral, oyster, seagrass, uh, mangrove, mangrove ecosystems, and so much more. Um, so again, really thrilled uh, that we that this task force is reconvened. Um, we stand committed uh, at, across the EPA, uh, both in Region 4 and in headquarters, uh, to support uh, these partnerships. So Again, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you so much, Ms. Fox, for those comments and uh, encouraging words. Um, so uh, we'd like to uh, open up the floor for uh, Mr. Secretary of the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, Mr. Sean Hamilton. Good morning, sir. Hey, good morning. Thank you, Adam. Um, first of all, Madam Chair, similar to you, this is my first task force meeting. Um, having me for the appointed secretary um, by Governor DeSantis. And I, I would, you know, again, I couldn't think of a better time to be secretary when you think about similar to what you heard Director Bartlett mention, the unparalleled commitment our governor has placed on the restoration of Everglades and water quality in the state, you know, calling for 2.5 billion to be invested in this, you know, within days of taking office. And again, I, I, I'm, I kid him with that and because I told him even I at the time, like, wow, 2.5 billion, um, you know, considering, you know, the out outlaying years and the commitment required. But here we are in this particular session going to not only meet that goal, we're going to blow it out of the water. And again, that just speaks to the commitment that we share, you know, here at the state level to moving this, you know, this opportunity forward. And I think with that, obviously, you know, one of the priorities, and you heard Drew mention this, you know, the cornerstone, if we think about some of those similar projects and the progress that's been made, SEP, uh, in, in the EAA um, treatment side of it. But again, be mindful that we also want to continue that momentum. You heard a lot about 
um, from our various internal booths and from Drew that the word of the day is progress and momentum. Well, we wanna do everything we can to make sure, and as Ron mentioned, make sure we basically exponentially increase that momentum. The timing's right, the, the opportunity's here, the funding is here to make sure we do everything we can to realize the value of these projects. And again, and be mindful of anything that undermines or somehow distracts us from those objectives, whether intentional or you know just just from a planning cycle, and you know including the EA reservoir, making sure we stay purposeful in our commitment to those projects because they're critical, right, to the end states that Drew mentioned. You know our opportunities to make sure our estuaries and our coastal waters are protected and realize the value from these projects, um, but also as you think about the majority of the states. Uh, population, a large percentage, you know, realize, re, re, you know, they rely on these systems down in South Florida to make sure that they have good places to work, good places to recreate, and we make sure we have abundant, you know, habitat for our natural systems and resources. And so, again, I look forward to supporting the task force and making sure um, from the state's level that we do everything from the collaboration, from project planning to, you know, strong science to make sure we deliver on those environmental benefits. Um, I would like to also um, draw attention to the fact I'm excited to hear the discussions around the coral reef coordination team. I think that is in itself an, another important opportunity. Um, I know the work, working group will be hopefully having follow-up discussions, but it's important that we provide an opportunity and a framework to make sure that we consider, you know, the management challenges associated um, with our coral reef, and more importantly, you know, think about how you know, the role they play in our resiliency and the ecosystem as a whole. And, and lastly, I think you've heard it also, you know, again, the size, the scope and scale of this restoration is unparalleled. And we've got, I know we've got a, a lot of new members on the task force, including myself. So, um, you know, like Alligator Run, I would like to invite the task force to come down and see firsthand, you know, maybe even prior to October's meeting. Uh, to get a chance to look at the complexity of this system. Again, that's the, you're really gaining an appreciation even more so than what you have now, what we're undertaking and how all this fits together. So Madam Chair and, and Adam, like I said, I'd like to also echo Alligator's Run invitation to come to South Florida. And with that, thank you all. Thank you so much, Mr. Secretary, for those encouraging words and uh, support uh, continued, uh, you know, uh, joint effort from the state uh, to support this this effort here. Um, uh, next, um, in, in uh, the representing uh, Todd Kim, uh, Assistant Attorney General for the Environment and Natural Resources Division for the United States Department of Justice. Lisa Russell, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair and all of you. It is my pleasure to be here representing Assistant Attorney General Todd Kim for the uh, Department of Justice. It's been a long time um, since I've attended one of these, as, as many of you, and I'm very pleased to see some of you who I've met before and, and many of you who I look forward to meeting in the future. The Department of Justice is here and pledges its support to all of the restoration activities. We applaud this renewed spirit of cooperation and collaboration, and we are here um, working largely in the background but are here to support all of these initiatives and promote, again, collaboration and, and keep us out of the courtroom. Um, and we look forward to all of these presentations and again, meeting you all and, and taking up some of you all on this trip. I'm sure Assistant Attorney General Kim would be delighted to have a tour and, and to see many of these beautiful resources in person. So thank you very much for including us and we look forward to participating and in, in learning more about the projects today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Russell. And thank you for DOJ's uh, participation today and into the future. Um, you know, uh, I heard uh, Mr. Secretary Hamilton mention coral reefs and uh, interestingly enough, uh, Assistant Administrator for NOAA's National Ocean Service, U.S. Department of Commerce, Nicole LaBeouf. We had some issues earlier with uh, hearing you on the microphone. I don't know uh, if you can hear me now and unmute and take the floor. There you go. Good morning. How are you? I'm here. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, awesome. ma'am. Well, you bet. good morning, everyone, and good morning, Adam. Welcome, Chair Trujillo, to your first meeting. It's wonderful to be back with all of you and to represent NOAA and the Department of Commerce as the Assistant Administrator of NOAA's National Ocean Service. And yes, I am also looking forward to getting back to Florida. Until then, it is encouraging to see how 
the task force remains active, productive, and passionate about our collective charge. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Drew and Colonel Booth for their updates this morning that really set the tone of momentum and progress for today's meeting. Of course, there is much more work to do, um, but for your accomplishments to date, I thank you. And of course, the Flamingos, thank you. Florida Bay, thanks you. Um, and we must continue. Uh, it is clear that this administration is making linkages between these important issues, such as ecosystem restoration and between federal agencies to meet the challenges of the climate crisis. This is important because all of these issues impact one another and will require multidisciplinary, multi-sectoral approaches. And we must all get better and better at playing to our strengths and leveraging those strengths with one another's working shoulder to shoulder. Along with my colleagues at Interior, Army Corps, EPA, and eight other federal agencies, as an example, I represent NOAA on the White House Coastal Resilience Interagency Working Group. This interagency working group is co-led by NOAA and CEQ, and we strive to work in an all-of-government approach to make sure that coastal communities have the science and resources they need to identify and implement effective coastal resilience and habitat restoration strategies. This interagency working group also includes the use of nature-based approaches highlighted in the recently released compendium of federal nature-based resources for coastal communities, states, tribes, and territories. We jointly release that on Earth Day. It is clear to me and across with my NOAA colleagues the significant role that the task force has to play in these, in these collective efforts and more than ever acknowledging the power of our natural ecosystems to help heal the planet. As I am sure is the same for other agencies here today, NOAA is excited to see the increase in funding and attention that the Everglades is receiving and has received through the FY22 budget and the Infrastructure Investments and Jobs Act. We are looking forward to hearing more about everyone's plans for increased financial investments during today's meeting. Indeed, NOAA received $1.6 billion in funds for coastal restoration and resilience, including marine debris efforts to directly assist states and regions in their work to remove marine debris from our nation's coasts and waterways. When it comes to resources, the recent passage of the bipartisan infrastructure law has created a historic expansion of opportunities to invest in ecosystem restoration and nature-based solutions, not just for NOAA, but for many of us here today. I am personally looking forward to better understanding the resources we have and the investment connections we can make between task force members and finding areas where NOAA can offer its support. NOAA is excited to bring our expertise to this work and to put our own work boots on, as Ron Alligator Bergeron noted, to join others boots on the ground in Florida and around our great nation to restore these amazing watery places. As the infrastructure projects get underway, I would welcome the opportunity to hear more about our collective efforts and application of best practices for nature-based solutions, possibly at a future task force meeting. I wanna thank the task force members for providing these updates today and for opportunities that we can find to work collaboratively with one another. And in the meantime, I continue to appreciate and share the task force commitment to Everglades and ecosystem restoration NOAA is committed to supporting these and other conservation efforts in South Florida. And as always, I welcome the discussion about how NOAA can continue to bring our science, data, expertise, and talents and boots to the task force and ecosystem health related projects within the Everglades restoration footprint. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to today's meeting. Thank you, Nicole. You always bring the passion here and, and understanding of uh, the challenges that we face here. So I appreciate your investments of time and, and your entire team. Um, thank you so much. Um, uh, representing uh, Carlos Monge, Undersecretary of Transportation for Policy, U.S. Department of Transportation, Colleen Vaughn. Um, are you on? I am. Thank you so much. Can you Great, hear me? Thank you. Oh, yes. That's loud and clear. Thank you so much. Perfect. Perfect. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I just want to make a, a short statement that the Department of Transportation greatly appreciates the opportunity to be a part of this task force and um, a contributing member to all the exciting work that is taking place with regard to restoration and resiliency. Um, as many of you have spoke of, um, the bipartisan infrastructure law 
contains many new funding opportunities, um, many of which, you know, within DOT for culverts and, and bridges. Um, and we're just excited to be part of this effort moving forward. And again, excited to be part of this task force. And um, it is my first meeting. So I'm very interested in learning more and, and being, you know, an active participant as we move forward. So again, I just wanna take this opportunity and say thank you. Thank you, colleague, and thanks for uh, all the folks' investments as well from the uh, Department of Transportation, both at the state and, and federal level. Um, next up, um, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, representing Jim Shore, General Counsel for the Seminole Tribe of Florida, Patty Power. Patty? Good morning, Adam, and good morning, morning. Um, everyone on the task force. It's nice to see you all, and um, it's, it's been a while. And um, it is it is great to get together, at least uh, virtually, but it will be really great to get together in person as, as soon as we can. Um, uh, on behalf of Mr. Shore, I want to um, just make a couple of quick notes. Um, first off, to, um, to thank um, ASA Connor for supporting the restarting of the uh, Western Everglades Restoration Project. Um, that was stalled for a while. Uh, this is a critical project, as we can see by some of the maps we saw in um, in Drew's presentation. That uh, we don't want to we don't want to wait on that one. Um, so we really appreciate that. Um, we are uh, looking forward to seeing the Lake of Chobe uh, Wetland Restoration Project um, work completed and authorized in the the Order 2022 bill this year. Um, and um, and finally, just uh, just huge rounds of applause for both the state and federal levels of funding. Um, so I've been coming to these meetings for a while. And I don't think we ever dreamed about numbers like this. Um, and it's, um, it's, it's really great to see. And, um, and it'll be great to see, um, I'm sure uh, Ava will, will share with us some changes in, in estimates on the, uh, the IDS and, and as we get closer and closer to uh, to seeing these projects get done. Um, so I'll wrap up with that. Thank you so much, Patty. Thank you very much for, for your time. Um, next, uh, representing the Office of Ecosystem Projects for the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, uh, Director Ed Smith. Do you have a minute? A couple morning, minutes. Adam. How much time you need? Thank you so much. Hey, morning. Here you go. clear. Uh, Madam Chair, Task Force members, thank you all for, uh, for being here today. Uh, it's certainly great to be here, and uh, this is a very exciting time for Everglades restoration. Uh, what I'm most excited about hearing today is the reaction of each of you uh, as we get the updates on Everglades restoration. Um, we've made tremendous progress over the past couple of years since our last task force meeting, and it's really exciting to see where we are. Uh, through the amazing support, um, both financially and from his leadership of Governor DeSantis, it's hard not to be overjoyed by the progress and outlook for SERP implementation. Well, I don't have the gravitas of Alligator Ron as far as long longevity and Everglades restoration. Uh, I remember back in 2014 when we used to get overjoyed, overly excited when we received over $100 million in support for these, pro uh, these, progress, these projects. Uh, and now with the governor's support, we're getting six times that on, an, on a recurring basis. Uh, it's certainly an, an exciting and amazing time. Um, and then also I want to uh, echo the, the secretary's sentiments on the uh, coral reef coordination. You know, it's, it's great to see the, the recognition of the importance of coral reefs for Everglades restoration and Everglades restoration on coral reefs. You know, without the coral reefs, we, the state of Florida is gonna suffer from sea level rise and without the Everglades restoration projects uh, that are being implemented through SERP, the, the coral reefs will certainly suffer. So that's great news that we're getting the support from NOAA, from USGS, from FWC, and all of our partners in the working group uh, on this important topic. And then finally, I want to just give a quick shout out to all of the hardworking staff that have dedicated their time uh, with, at South Florida Water Management District, you know, uh, Army Corps of Engineers, DOI, FWC, uh, Florida Department of Transportation, um, and, and of course, 
my team here at DEP whose efforts every day have gotten us to this point. And I know I'm confident that, you know, even though there are challenges ahead of us, as uh, Gene Duncan has pointed out, we've got the right people in the right place from leadership on down to staff to overcome each and every one of those challenges. Thank you, Adam. Thank you so much, Ed, and uh, thanks for your continued uh, investments and time in championing this effort as well. Uh, up next, um, representing Eric Sutton, uh, we had a conflict today. The uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission uh, is having their uh, quarterly meeting today and tomorrow. Um, I think I believe up in Tallahassee, so Eric Sutton is not able to be with us, the special advisor from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, and uh, representing uh, him at this meeting is Mr. James Erskine. James, good morning, sir. Good morning, Adam. Good morning, Chairman. Good morning. Sound check? Yes, sir. I hear you loud and clear, James. Thank good you morning, so much. members. Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman, for calling this meeting. James Erskine, Everglades Coordinator with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, as Adam said, serving for Executive Director Sutton, who has a conflict today with our statewide commission meeting where many important topics are being discussed. Glad to be here today and look forward to a great meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much, James. Um, and uh, up next, um, I'd like to uh, briefly, quickly introduce uh, Lawrence Glenn from the South Florida Water Management District. He is your interim science, uh, interim chair on the science coordination group. Uh, Lawrence, uh, do you have some introductory remarks? Over. Lawrence? Okay. Um, if you're trying to talk, Lawrence, uh, one of the complexities that we uh, have uh, dealt with over uh, this previous time with the virtual platform. Um, Lawrence, if, if you have comments later, we'll come back to you later on in the uh, presentation. So, oh, hi. Oh, I'm hey. here. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, all good. Uh, no, all thank good. you very much for, uh, for having us today. Um, I'll be talking about the science and coordination group a little later. Uh, we're very excited to talk about the science that is done, how we do that, how we coordinate amongst all the different groups that are out there working on Everglades restoration. It's exciting. We get to do the work to say, is restoration working? So we'll, uh, we'll be very excited to talk about that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. I really look forward to it. Um, and uh, next up on the agenda, that, that pretty much uh, concludes the, the whip around session for, for this, um, this portion, agenda item number three. Uh, the OERI team has been uh, watching the, the platform for elected officials. Um, at this time, we do not uh, recognize or do not, uh, have not uh, noticed any elected officials. If there are any elected officials that are attending, uh, please use the raise your hand feature and uh, provide some some opportunities for comments to the task force. And at any time, uh, please um, raise your hand if you if I happen to miss it at this time. But not right. Okay. Sorry, uh, Kevin. Sorry, Kevin Ruane's hand is raised. Sorry, task force member. Hello, Kevin. Hand is raised, sir. Good morning. Uh, yes, this is uh, Pamela Smith for Commissioner Kevin Ruane. He will be with you shortly because we have a commissioner meeting this morning. Um, he's looking forward to discussion regarding all of the agenda items, but he's particularly looking forward to a robust discussion regarding the integrated delivery schedule and the Lake Okeechobee system operating schedule. And just to give you a little bit of history for Commissioner Ruane, he started his elected official career in 2007 when he was appointed to the City of Sanibel uh, Commission. Uh, through that, he hit the ground running for his interest in clean water delivery to the uh, Caloosahatchee River estuary. As you know, we've seen some devastating effects from dirty water from Lake Okeechobee. 
as he continued his career, including about 12 years as mayor of the city of Sanibel, he won his bid for election for the Lee County Board of County Commissioners and last year was the chair. Just so that you know, he will continue his endeavors to make sure that we have clean water going through the Lake, uh, pardon me, from Lake Okeechobee to the Caloosahatchee Estuary and going to the Everglades. I appreciate the comments made and the reports given by Colonel Booth and Mr. Bartlett, but I also appreciate the comments by Mr. Duncan that we do not forget how important our natural resources are through this process. And I appreciate you uh, providing me the opportunity to speak on his behalf. Thank you much. Thank you, Pamela. Uh, Kevin, Mr. Commissioner Wayne's always been a champion of this, like many others on this call today. Um, and apologies for uh, uh, not recognizing you and the commissioner uh, during, during the whip around. Um, not seeing any uh, hands raised from any elected officials. Uh, we are at this time and not seeing any other hands from uh, task force members uh, or representatives. Uh, we're gonna move on now to uh, agenda item number four, the October 2020 meeting summary. Um, uh, Assistant Secretary Chair uh, Tanya Trujillo had to step away for a quick moment and uh, we'll be returning shortly. Um, and at that time, I will be turning the meeting back over to her. Um, the meeting summary uh, from 2020, uh, many of you were, were not here during that task force meeting. Uh, the, the meeting summary for the October 2020 task force uh, is provided on the EvergladesRestoration.gov uh, website. Um, as a reminder, everything related to the task force can be found on the website. So uh, typically we would take a, a uh, vote and, and, and uh, enter those in as part of the record. Uh, but we're just going to go ahead and post those meeting summaries. And again, if any comments related to that, please uh, reach out to me or my office uh, regarding that. Um, and again, I encourage any hands to be raised during any of these uh, items, should any of the task force members have any questions or comments um, regarding the, today's proceedings. So um, again, not seeing any hands at, at this particular time, which keeps the order. Uh, we're going to move on to uh, item number five, and uh, we're ahead of schedule, which is an excellent, uh, excellent thing, um, an excellent portion here that we have plenty of time to uh, take public comment and so forth. Um, anyhow, um, we're going to roll into uh, a, a brief background for new members, old members, uh, new members of the public on the reasons for uh, and the background behind the, the South Florida Ecosystem Restoration Task Force roles and responsibilities. Um, and again, continuing on this theme of building the, the framework for us to continue to meet, uh, to advance restoration in, uh, in subsequent meetings um, and make sure we're all on the same, same page. Next slide, Marsha. Um, you know, coming this late or not late, but in this portion of the presentation, many have already gone over many of the, the uh, items here that are in this presentation. So it's, it's just a, it's a reaffirmation of of the information to drive home that this is a very large scale project. It's a large ecosystem as uh, Colonel Booth had in his presentation, it's 18,000 square miles uh, with, with four national park units, uh, including Everglades National Park, Big Cypress National Preserve, Biscayne and well to the south, uh, Dry Tortugas, 16 national wildlife refuges. Um, next slide, please. The task force was established by WERDA 1996. All of this information, again, is on the website. It, it defines how our, all of our operating uh, procedures, purposes, and duties. Um, and the Office of Everglades Restoration here is to support you all and, and the working group and the subgroups, the working group and the science coordination group to take action on your uh, recommendations and directives to further advance restoration. Um, and then report back in subsequent task force meeting the results of those, um, those items. Next slide, please, Marsha. Thanks. The membership is uh, made up of seven federal, uh, as represented by the membership here. We are working with uh, the uh, Secretary of Agriculture's office at this time to you know, fill that seat, and they're working, uh, and they're working on that process right now. Uh, in addition to the seven uh, mem federal members, uh, the two tribal uh, members here as well, represented by Gene Duncan at the Miccosukee Tribe of Indians of Florida, 
uh, Patty Power representing uh, the, the Seminole Tribe of, of Florida. Uh, to round out the, the, the task force membership, uh, these are all representatives as appointed by the governor of the state of Florida um, and very robust team that is heavily engaged in, in Everglades restoration and the entire South Florida landscape. Uh, thank you, Marcia. On to the next slide. So this is a, a brief synopsis of how what, what I was just referring to is how we are organized with the task force. Um, but, but taking note that stakeholder engagement uh, is, is critically important uh, to this program and it encompasses all of these, all of these groups um, that are working to advance restoration and work through the items that the task force um, recommends that the, the working group and the science coordination group uh, undertake. So to put this in a visual perspective, um, this is a good way to look at it here. Thank you so much, Marsha. So it's a, a very busy slide and it, it just represents how, again, a little bit more details on, on how uh, the task force uh, is, is organized with the working group, the science coordination group, and then the ability to engage additional advisory bodies and additional subgroups and, and, and teams um, as needed and established by the, the task force um, to, to advance restoration as issues evolve and change and morph uh, over the, uh, there's a lot of flexibilities built into the organization of this structure. And again, this is uh, your, your task force uh, members and, and, and uh, they will fulfill your, your, your directions. Um, and again, uh, stakeholder engagement is completely, and I'd like to emphasize a vital, vital part of, of Everglades restoration uh, in order to advance this. I'd like to also make special note that the task force and its subgroup teams are not considered advisory committees under the Federal Advisory Committee Act, better known as FACA. Marsha, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, again, it's strategic coordination um, and, and system-wide perspective to guide Everglades restoration. Uh, to, to really whittle it down, it's getting the water right. Uh, you'll hear uh, time and time again, and maybe this is on another slide coming up, uh, you've heard it from others, uh, quality, quantity, timing, and distribution, QQTD, is getting the water right. Uh, restore, preserve, and protect the natural habitats of species and foster the compatibility between the built and natural systems. Uh, there's been great advancements in that, and, and really that's been a, a significant target uh, that we've been seeing uh, with this uh, recent uh, uptick in funding. I've uh, been really developing that uh, in, in a very strong fashion. We have a ways to go. Um, and there are challenges along the way. Uh, thank you, Marsha, next slide. So again, uh, to reiterate, your all's primary duties are to work together, collaborate, we encourage that, it's encouraged. Um, the, the working group, the stakeholders uh, all encourage that and working to exchange and really conflict resolution. And, and that's really the, 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 it's the challenge, right? That's the challenge is conflict resolution um, and, and continuing to focus and not know that this meeting and you all, the task force, are pretty much the only um, focused meeting on specifically just for Everglades restoration. Um, and, and actually it's the South Florida Ecosystem Restoration Task Force, so it can even extend beyond just CERB. Um, so anyhow, next slide, Marsha. So moving on, that, that was the completion of, of the overview. Um, as part of my uh, report to you all, um, the congressionally uh, mandated uh, and statutory responsibilities of the Office of Everglades Restoration. We produce and collaborate with our partners in restoration, all of those that are on the call here uh, today and hopefully soon to be back in person, um, a series of reports. Next slide, Marsha. So the first one up is the biennial report. Um, it, it's really the progress made towards restoration. It's an all encompassing uh, updated report um, that, that we are in the progress of, um, and next is the timeline. Um, and, and so we're currently uh, requesting, um, been requesting the agencies for um, information um, and the information is due back. And you can see the timeline here uh, to manage expectations when that biennial report timeline will be completed. Um, and, and the team here at OERI is very focused on pulling that together um, and will meet those deadlines uh, for that October, um, December timeline there that you see at the end. If there's any questions, again, um, task force members later on um, and, and attendees, uh, we can provide that either now or um, afterwards. Next slide, Marsha. 
The next one is the integrated financial uh, plan. This is a very, very detailed, uh, very detailed project uh, and, and plan and document that is produced. Um, if you ever wanted to know anything about any project, uh, the team at OERI here has compiled that information and has a longstanding uh, file to continue to uh, advance that uh, financial plan for full uh, job cost accounting and, and work share. Watch the next slide. So the timeline for this is uh, we're, we're well on, on track to, to complete this uh, document in, in September 2022. Um, and we should be able to bring that back before the task force. Uh, hopefully for the October meeting, and um, and and be be completed with that by this time. March next slide. Thank you. Uh, the cross cut budget, uh, coordinated budget between the federal and state agencies, as it said here in the slide, it's a detailed document again um, with spreadsheets, spreadsheets, spreadsheets. Thank you so much, March Next slide. So again, um, the uh, funding information is due uh, this month. So if you haven't, and you're on the call and you haven't gotten your information to us, um, please uh, consider getting that to us so we can meet the deadline here in June of 2022. And we'll be able to provide an update uh, during our next task force meeting and probably uh, provide that during any future, uh, during the summer working group and science coordination group joint meetings. So the system-wide ecological indicators report, uh, this is a, um, a, a detailed system-wide report on uh, a variety of uh, ecological indicators uh, that is part of our overall reporting responsibility um, that is involves multiple, multiple agencies. Uh, we, we, you hear about it on the call today, how so many are um, working across boundaries, across agencies, and, and this is one of those that, that is, uh, clearly indicates our abilities to continue to work together. Uh, again, this is, uh, it's due to Laura Brandt coming up here in June of 2022, and um, it should be soon, soon after incorporated uh, into part of the, as part of the biennial report. Um, and that's where it is housed. It's not a standalone document, and, and we hope to include that uh, in the, um, when we finally prepare and release the biennial report. So not seeing any Questions and again, we can we can back up in any one of these presentations and address comments or questions as they arise um, during the uh, during the entire presentation today. So, uh, not seeing any hands raised, um, I think that we're going to continue with the trajectory here for uh, the um, the uh, uh, overall momentum history of how we've gotten to this place and. And restoration and then looking forward to the next presentations after uh, Robert Johnson's science advisor to, to the, the Office of Everglades Restoration. And, and so we're gonna to start to build that framework. Bob, are you on, sir? Uh, yes, I am. Thank you, I hear you loud and clear. Uh, would you please take over? Sure, I'm gonna give a uh, quick uh, introduction, mostly for the new members on the hydrologic evolution of the South Florida ecosystem kind of why we're at the point we need to spend to $20 billion to restore this part of uh, uh, the U.S. And then I'm going to do a very quick run through on our ongoing restoration initiatives. So, Marcia, can you run that video? Water is the lifeblood of the Everglades and the South Florida economy. The Everglades watershed begins in the headwaters of the Kissimmee River and flows southward 70 miles into Lake Okeechobee. Historically, a shallow sheet of fresh water flowed for 100 miles from the southern edge of Lake Okeechobee to Florida Bay. The water moved slowly over the extremely flat Everglades landscape through the wetlands into coastal bays and estuaries creating a river of grass. Today, this diverse mosaic of landscapes and seascapes supports a complex natural and man-made ecosystem linked by flowing water. Human development altered the South Florida landscape. Drainage projects in the Greater Everglades watershed began in the Kissimmee River Basin and the upper Caloosahatchee wetlands in the 1880s. By the 1920s, six major canals redirected water from Lake Okeechobee to the Atlantic and Gulf coasts. 
During the 1930s, a levee system was constructed around much of Lake Okeechobee, and by the 1950s, the northern Everglades were diked and drained to form the Everglades Agricultural Area. By the 1960s, the central Everglades were enclosed with levees forming five water conservation areas. The overall goal of this project was reclaiming the swamp to promote agricultural and urban development. By the early 20th century, this combination of land use and water management actions disrupted the Everglades' natural water flow and ecosystem functioning. By the 1980s, the adverse impacts of drainage and development in South Florida were well recognized. The state of Florida and the federal government began major land acquisition programs and several localized restoration projects in the Kissimmee River and Southern Everglades. And Marcia, can you go to back to the PowerPoint? And next slide. Uh, this is the uh, kind of overall Everglades restoration and uh, hydrologic uh, goals for uh, restoration coming from the Central and Southern Florida restudy. Uh, so the overall goal is to reverse the major unintended impacts to the natural system attributed to the construction of the Central and Southern Florida project. And as you can see, these impacts include the things we've been talking about, extreme fluctuations in water levels in Lake Okeechobee, damaging discharges to the Clusahatchee and St. Lucie estuaries, uh, detrimental water depths and flooding durations in the Everglades, unsuitable freshwater flows to the Atlantic coasts and the Florida Bay, Biscayne, and Lake Worth uh, estuaries, and degraded water quality creating imbalances of native flora and fauna. So those are the things we've been trying to address through restoration. Uh, and now I'm just going to step through some maps to show you the projects that are being implemented uh, as we go through restoration. And I'm going to look at it from a kind of a functional perspective. So First, look at the symbols at the bottom. Uh, those little X's indicate areas that we're trying to improve the connectivity and sheet flow or overland flow across the Everglades. Uh, then there's improved water quality, that little picture of a uh, man-made marsh. Those are uh, stormwater treatment areas and flow equalization basins uh, that are being built. Then there's uh, the groundwater seepage retention. Uh, basically, features are trying to keep water in the system, uh, keep it from leaking out. Uh, and causing impacts. Uh, and then there's uh, overall improvements in water management operations, those big uh, gates you see being open and closed. So uh, this first slide is the foundation projects that are non-CERT projects, generally authorized uh, either before or during CERT, but through separate authorities. Uh, we already talked about that the Northern end, the Kissimmee River restoration starting in the 1990s being completed in 2021. That's one of these projects to improve the connectivity in that system and restore portions of the historic Kissimmee River floodplain. Uh, next, we'll talk about the Herb Hoover Dyke rehabilitation that was authorized in uh, early 2000s and is going to be completed this year. Uh, and associated with that is the Lake Okeechobee System Operating Manual that's currently underway, should be completed by the end of the year and implemented in 2023. That is there to safely retain inflows from the Kissimmee while balancing Lake Okeechobee health and regional water demands. Then the uh, Everglades construction project and the uh, restoration strategies, two large uh, state of uh, Florida projects designed to construct features to retain and treat Everglades agricultural area runoff and improve water quality to the Everglades. Uh, then finally, a series of projects uh, authorized in the late 1980s, early 1990s, the Modified Water Deliveries to Everglades National Park Project. Uh, mm -hmm. It was completed in 2018. The Canal 111, C-111 South Dade Project completed in 2019. Uh, combined Operational Plan uh, that was worked on and completed in 2020. And the only on ongoing project is the Tamiami Trail Next Steps Project uh, that's trying to remove Tamiami Trail as a... Uh, obstruction to flow, that's a uh, uh, federal department of transportation project. Uh, so I wanna make sure we call out uh, the involvement of the transportation sector there between the state and the federal government. Uh, and that's focused on improving water flows into that Northeastern portion of Everglades National Park, uh, Shark River Slough, Taylor Slough, and having to maintain uh, authorized levels of uh, flood protection in South Dade. So go to the next slide. This is the first generation of the uh, 
Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan projects that were authorized in word of 2007. There are two uh, major components, the Indian River Lagoon South project. The first phase of that, uh, the C44 Reservoir and STA was already spoken about, uh, was completed in 2021. The newer projects that are ongoing are the C23, C24, C25 Reservoirs in the upper part there, and STAs uh, uh, that are expected to be done by 2030. Those have a combined benefit of about 170,000 acre feet of new water storage, water quality treatment, and then additional natural area storage. So now there's a new icon in the bottom uh, that is surface water uh, reservoirs. So those are the first reservoirs showing up as part of these projects. Next is the Picayune Strand project over on the Southwest coast that Bruce spoke about. Uh, started in 2010, expected to be done in 2025. The goal is to remove historic roads and fill in canals to restore sheet flow across 55,000 acres of natural habitat. Uh, go on to the next slide, Marcia. This is the uh, CERP Generation 2 projects authorized in the Water Resource Development Act of 2014. Uh, starting in the Cahoosahatchee River is the uh, Cahoosahatchee River West Basin Storage, C43 Reservoir, and uh, a future STA that's being designed and built. That's another 170,000 acre feet of new water storage and water quality treatment uh, to benefit the Clusatchee River estuary. Uh, next is the Broward County Water Preserve Areas on the eastern side of the uh, water conservation areas. Uh, started in 2016, expected to be done by 2030. Uh, that's gonna reduce groundwater seepage out of water conservation areas 3A and 3B, improve your urban water supply and help with saltwater intrusion. Uh, next is the Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands Project, uh, started in 2012, expected to be done in 2024, and that will redirect canal flows back into the coastal wetlands to rehydrate those wetlands and try to push back against uh, saltwater entering the uh, marshes. And then finally, uh, an expansion of the C-111 Project, the C-111 Spreader Canal Western Project in SERP, uh, uh, authorized and completed in 2012, uh, uh, by the Water Management District, uh, and that's designed to retain groundwater seepage and improve water flows into Taylor Slough and ultimately Florida Bay. The next slide. Okay, now we're into the SERP Generation 3 projects uh, that are being authorized in the word of 2016, 2018, and 2020 acts, uh, starting with uh, Loch Tatchy River Watershed Restoration Project. Uh, that's kind of just beginning it's gonna restore flows into the Loxahatchee River to protect the largest remaining riverine cypress habitats in the southeastern Florida. Uh, the large project in this group is the Central Everglades Project or SEP, uh, made up of four components. Uh, at the northern end, it's the uh, EA Reservoir uh, that's expected to be done by 2029. That's gonna store and treat Lake Okeechobee flows before going to the Everglades. Uh, just south of that, along the border of the northern end of Water Conservation Area 3 is the SEP North project, expected to be completed in 2026. That's designed to restore flows into northwestern Water Conservation Area 3A, backfill a portion of the uh, Miami Canal, and that'll all promote uh, sheet flow and improved water flows to the south. Uh, down at the southern end of Water Conservation Area 3A is the SEP South components, expected to be done in 2029. They're designed to improve connectivity between Water Conservation Area 3A, 3B, and Northeast Shark River Slough. And then uh, the Central Everglades New Water component is designed to retain uh, groundwater seepage from uh, all these increased uh, Central Everglades flows that go into Northeast Shark River Slough. Uh, that's been greatly accelerated by efforts by the South Florida Water Management District that Drew talked about, and hopefully an extension into the Army Corps project uh, shooting for a completion date of 2024. And then uh, one last slide. This is the uh, SERP planning projects that are all in the white zone at the bottom of the, in, of the uh, integrated delivery schedule. Uh, they're anticipated to be authorized in the Water Resource Development Act of 2022 through 2028. Uh, first, I wanna talk about the new components here on the bottom left. You see, this is the first applications of uh, proposed wastewater reuse, aquifer storage and recovery, and in-ground reservoirs. At least they'll all be evaluated in these phases. So this is the, starting with Lake Okeechobee Watershed Restoration Project, uh, authorized hopefully in uh, WERDA 2022, uh, is designed to control Lake Okeechobee inflows and water levels 
using the first large scale ASR wells uh, in the watershed. Next is the Western Everglades Restoration Project that's uh, anticipated to be authorized in word of 2024. The tentatively selected plan will uh, move forward to reestablish sheet flow and improve water quality on tribal lands and the Big Cypress uh, National Preserve before that water flowing into water conservation area 3A. Uh, next, the, we'll call it the Biscayne Bay Southeastern Everglades Ecosystem Restoration Project that uh, started just recently, uh, expected to be in word of 2026. The preliminary alternatives focus on restoring sheet flow and improving water quality in the Southeast coastal wetlands via a series of new water sources that have to be identified. And then finally, the Southern Everglades study, which hasn't even uh, begun yet. Uh, it's planned to start in 2023 uh, and hopefully go into word of 2028. It's designed to improve sheet flow in the central and southern Everglades and into Florida Bay via seepage management along the eastern side of the water conservation areas and new water storage options, uh, particularly evaluating below ground storage in a portion of Miami-Dade County that are uh, rock mines. And those are all the projects that uh, we'll step through and uh, I don't see any questions. So I'll turn it back over to Adam. Ron Bergeron, please, your hand was raised, sir. You're on mute, sir. Ron, you're on mute. Sir. Yeah, first, uh, yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yeah, well, first I wanna thank uh, uh, Bob Johnson for his dedication uh, for several decades, his knowledge, and uh, I just want you to know how much I think of you, uh, Bob, in regards to what you've done for Everglades restoration. I would like to add some comments uh, uh, to Bob is uh, brought up by the Miccosukee Indians on the Cape Sable Sparrow single species protection. Uh, that is being addressed. Uh, we are working, we've had quarterly meetings for the last two years with U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, in regards to uh, Zone A of the Cape Sable Sparrow, which has been documented to be excapated. Uh, so reestablishing the natural sheet flow and equalizing with shared adversities between the Central Everglades and Everglades National Park under modified water delivery where we're not shifting the water to the east side of um, Shark River Slough 100% nine months out of the year. We are resolving that issue and we're also adding three additional culverts in the L28 to let water flow southwest, remodeling the Tamami Trail and Loop Road to allow that water to go to uh, the 10,000 Islands Ridge and Sloughs by gravity, natural, so the whole face of the Tamiami Trail is so important that these barriers are removed and we have natural flow to Florida Bay. So that right now there's a blueprint uh, on global management endangered species across the global system, which allows us to move water, not alter the environment, not alter the natural sheet flow. And that's so important once we make this connection at the Tamami Trail, which is being raised, should be completed in the next uh, couple of years that we can hit the second stage of modified water delivery along with the seepage wall uh, that protects the eight and a half square mile area. Uh, we are gonna be looking at water getting to Florida Bay, uh, stopping seagrass from dying. This is an intricate part of modified water delivery. And I'm really excited once we remove these barriers and get the benefit of over a billion dollars of 3.6 miles of bridges and infrastructure uh, that free, free, free structures are in. And we're at the threshold due to hard work uh, with you, Bob, and all of our federal and state agencies uh, that water naturally flowing to Florida Bay in the next few years uh, is in our view and it's very, very exciting. So I just wanted to make those comments and uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Thank you, Rod, for those words. And uh, yes, I didn't give Bob the uh, the proper introduction. Yes, you are correct. Over three decades of dedication to the Everglades and, and uh, this overall program. So uh, thank you, Bob, for that overview. Uh, not seeing any more hands, I'd like to recognize that the uh, Chair Trujillo has uh, returned to the meeting, and I will be turning the time back over to her. Tanya? Thank you, Adam, and thank you, Bob. I was able to catch most of the conversation, but had uh, was off camera for a little while. So I really appreciate being able to continue to learn about the great progress that we do have going on. I know um, next up is my understanding that we are at the uh, vice chair nomination portion. Is that correct? Yes, that is, ma'am. Okay. Well, we have, um, I know we have the, uh, Adam, I think I'd turn it back over to you as yeah, I understand it. It does. Yes, okay. you bet. You bet. So uh, just to re re remind and refresh everybody's uh, uh, knowledge here, uh, that former secretary, uh, Noah Valenstein, served as the vice chair during his tenure uh, with FDEP. Uh, he was served under the direction uh, as a task force member by the governor, um, and that seat is now vacant. Um, and any new uh, member of the task force may nominate another member uh, chair uh, who is not represented representative of who is not representative of a federal agency. Um, we, you know, request that uh, discussion uh, and you direct the uh, uh, voting. It may occur at this meeting. Uh, all members, uh, both federal and non-federal, federal, non-federal non may vote for the vice chair. And so um, I ask you to take over from here, uh, Madam Chair. Yes. Okay, thank you all very much. I think I would like to ask if anybody has a nomination. I see Mr. Smith has a hand up. Morning, Madam Chair, thank you so much. Uh, if I may, I'd like to offer Secretary Sean Hamilton to the task force members for consideration as the next vice chair. You know, Governor, Governor DeSantis has entrusted Secretary Hamilton to oversee the issues before this task force, as well as protecting, preserving, and restoring all of Florida's natural resources. He was asked to become secretary because of his compassion for environmental protection, his wisdom in making decisions, and his innate ability to lead. And for these reasons, I would like to make, I think, I believe he would make an excellent vice chair for the task force. Thank you, Ed. Uh, Madam Chair, you have hands raised by Mr. Bergeron and uh, Kevin Ruey. I'd like to okay. second that motion. Okay, I saw Mr. Connor had a hand as well. I was simply going to second the motion also. Thank you. Okay. So was I. We can have a little um, debate on the, about that. Who has the, the second? No, thank you all very much for the, for the motion. Thank you for the motion and thank you for the seconds. And I am happy to open the floor for any discussion or comments, please. Madam Chair, Ron Bergeron has his hand raised. Yeah. Yes, sir. I, I think uh, Secretary Hamilton is, is more than qualified and, and uh, I know his passion and dedication to the environment uh, is impeccable. And I think we ought to close and vote. Okay. Are there any objections to us moving forward with the vote? Okay, As, is anyone opposed to the nomination? I see, I see and hear no opposition. So I assume we have the, excuse me. Is there any requirement that we take a vote or can we presume that we have the consensus? Vote. It's a unanimous vote, Madam okay. Chair. Thank you very much. So hearing no objections, we, we have a brand new vice chair. So welcome, Mr. Secretary, and happy to have you on board. 
Yes, perfect. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and to the rest of the task force. Look forward to serving you know, our collective goals of restoring the Everglades. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. And we'll be able to meet each other soon in person, I hope. Okay, so moving on to the next agenda item. I think we are at number seven, the report of the working group and science coordination group activities. I know everyone on the working group uh, assists us all on the task force with the efforts that we have underway. So I'm looking forward again to hearing and learning from the reports that we have teed up now. Adam, do you lead? Are you yep. able to lead us through? Okay. So great. we have, yeah, we have one quick item to address okay. uh, before that, okay. and it's going to require uh, task force uh, uh, approval. Um, okay. Since uh, 2020, we've had some changes in our leadership here, and and uh, I'd like to uh, note the request from the SCG, from the entire SCG, that is in support uh, that the task force uh, move to approve Lawrence Glenn as the chair of the task force of the South Florida, uh, sorry, the, the Science Coordination Group, excuse me, and, and that Angie Dunn uh, from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers have been serving in the interim role for some time now. So we're, we're asking uh, for you to lead uh, uh, the same kind of uh, discussion and voting um, and with the, uh, with the with the task force members uh, to consider Lawrence Glenn, uh, SCG Chair, and Angela Dunn as the SCG Vice Chair. Okay, thank you, Adam. Is there any objection or can we have a consensus unanimous approval again for the, the appointment of Mr. Glenn and uh, Ms. Dunn? I make the motion. Thank you, sir. I will second Kevin. it. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, any objection? Any discussion? I guess I should ask for discussion first. No discussion and no objections. So we can assume that we have unanimous support for that step. Thank you for walking us through it, Kevin. Great, thank you. That's successful and uh, doing a great job uh, leaving the group <laughs> there. So um, I think I'm gonna, it's back to you, uh, Madam, to uh, move us along to these presentations uh, starting off with James. Okay, so would we, are we, um, Hoping to hear from Mr. Erskine, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, happy to introduce it. James, take us away. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Task Force members. For the record, James Erskine, Everglades Coordinator with Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. I get to wear two hats today, and I'm proud of that. Um, I would also like to say I've been engaged with the Working Group, Science Coordination Group, and Task Force for a number of years. And because of the momentum discussed earlier, and the ecological benefits for Florida's fish and wildlife that we're observing throughout the system because of restoration and because of restoring that natural hydrology and that natural water flow that Alligator Ron Bergeron has mentioned earlier, it is really a great time to be chairman of your working group. Next slide, please. The mission of the, the, mission of the working group, science coordination groups and all the subgroups beneath it is the same. And it's here on the charter, but I will just paraphrase it as it's to support the task force and its efforts for restoration, preservation, and protection of the South Florida ecosystem. Next slide, please. We have both duties and, duties and powers or authorities in our charter. Our duties, our duties are to assist the task force in report preparation. And we're currently working on a number of reports that Adam pointed out, including the 2020 biennial report required by the Water Resource Development Act. And we are working on the financial planning reports and other priorities assigned by the task force. And that's a key, that's a key part of the charter for other priorities assigned by the task force. We are here to assist. The authorities of the working group holds is the power to convene. And we are a great group and the power to convene granted through our charter by establishment, by establishing advisory bodies or seeking the advice from the best possible exports and sources. That allows us to have the most engaging meetings. And uh, that is also recognized in the charter. 
Next slide, please. Generally speaking, the Working Group and Science Coordination Group has a combined membership of 42 members, and we meet jointly twice, we meet jointly three times a year to conduct business, discuss opportunities, and receive project level updates from the state and federal partners. Additionally, we generally take a deeper dive on one or two subjects, time limited at each meeting. Sometimes it may be three subjects, but the deeper dives do take a little more effort of our team and take a, 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 a bigger bite out of our agenda. Between meetings, we have hosted, or sometimes in conjunction with other meetings, we have a great track record of facilitating task force sponsored workshops on various topics of interest. Topics of interest. The most recent workshops we've had was the Biscayne Bear and Southern Everglades workshop in 2020 and a integrated delivery schedule workshop in 2021. These workshops not only allow the team members to take a robust discussion on the topics, it provides a great opportunity for the public to engage directly with your scientists and your technical staff at the workshops. Next slide, please. Here is an example of some of the things we cover on our different work, uh, working group and science coordination group meetings. And these examples are not comprehensive. They're just meant to reinforce to our task force members that our that participation is essential in a good meeting and that these topics represent the regular updates and topics brought forward from your representative agency members for a deeper dive. And they include things such as the prior, such priorities as aquifer storage and recovery, seepage management, which we heard a little bit about earlier today, the REMAP, the Everglades Regional Environmental Monitoring and Assessment Program, and a deeper dive on coral disease resp response and restoration, which is a multi-agency focus. Next slide, please. Here, I'd like to hand it off to Science Coordination Group Chairman Lawrence Klein. Thank you, James. Can everybody hear me? I got you. Yes. Lord. Yep. Fantastic. First, I I, I want to express my sincere thanks for the confirmation to serve as the chair of the science and coordination group. Um, it is such an amazing group of scientists across South Florida that it, it's really an honor. And as you saw Dr. Johnson speaking earlier, I, I'm following in some big footsteps. So I hope to be able to, be able to, to carry that forward. forward, forward Lawrence, this is Adam. Lawrence, if I could interrupt, there's a little problem with your audio. I'm not sure uh, where it is. Sorry uh, to Can you, you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, OK. Let's try to go on. Thank OK. You. That's OK. My apologies. Uh, as following the same format, um, as James, you see that we also have duties as the science coordination group. And uh, we were established also to support the task force and support the working group in all things science. So that is aspects of policy, strategies, plans, and programs uh, that are needed to coordinate the science of South Florida and, and what is being done to look at the South Florida ecosystem. Um, in that, we do a lot of reporting. Um, we have a science coordination plan, and this tracks and coordinates science at a programmatic level um, across all of the different agencies that are working uh, and independent workers looking to see what are the current science needs, do we have any gaps, and then this science is used to inform decisions. So we are not a decision-making body. Instead, we provide the scientific information to help guide those important decisions that are made on project construction or how, how things need to move forward. Um, we've done some reporting on inv invasive exotic species. Uh, we also have a system-wide ecological indicators report that is very important. And this is a, these are benchmarks. Are we hitting the, the, the certain levels for different indicators of the ecosystem to say that we are tracking where we should be in response based on what projects are in the ground, and then those will also be used ultimately to evaluate success of, of greater Everglades restoration. Next slide, please. Uh, there are different ways, so coordination is in our name, <laughs> and it's very important that we get that done. So we have uh, several different mechanisms in order to coordinate the science across uh, South Florida. Um, as James mentioned, we do, use the joint working group science group meetings. Um, we have the production of numerous science and restoration reports. Uh, we will uh, take in, in 
you saw earlier there was a lot of lot that we can establish working working groups and, and, and sub teams. So we will we will convene scientific workshops on specific topics of interest that that we need to move forward. Um, there's participation in independent science meetings and conferences. Gear Greater Everglades Ecosystem Restoration is one of those that brings all of the science and scientists from uh, around the country that are working in, in the Everglades to to understand where everybody is currently, what the new findings are, and it helps us tool up for filling the gaps that we still have ahead of us. Uh, we developed system ecosystem uh, scientific tools, as I said, for the system-wide ecological indicators. Uh, we also utilize independent scientific panels and experts to review our products. Uh, we are scientists ourselves, but it's always great to have another set of expert eyes looking at the work that we're doing to ensure it's of the highest integrity. Um, and then we also review independently developed science and policy reports to ensure that we know what's going on out in the community um, and we can leverage that to remain current on what are the needs for restoration science planning and policy. Next slide, please. So here are some past and current activities that we've done. Um, the first one, the significance of flow to Everglades restoration. Most people today understand that flow is a critical component of ecosystem restoration for the Everglades. But originally there was really more weight being held on depth and duration. And we didn't understand the, the need and the, the significance of actual physical flow in, in keeping the ridge and slough uh, areas the way they are for transporting different um, necessary uh, bed load, you know, for keeping those different types of, of systems, you know, viable. So it seems commonplace now, but that was something that there's a large workshop, several years of really in-depth study to find out exactly how important flow is and, and what those flow measurements would be. Another great example was during, or after Hurricane Irma, um, Nick Allman, who was the working group uh, chair or co-chair at the time, pulled together all the science that were, that were wondering what was the, what was the impact of, of Hurricane, Hurricane Irma. Instead of everybody doing things on their own, pulled together a workshop and said, okay, what questions do we need to look at? How are we going to approach this? How can we not duplicate our efforts to make sure that we are getting the most of, of everybody's expertise? So that those are ideas of how we can pull the scientific together uh, community together quickly in order to address of uh, important topics that can impact or help restoration of the Everglades. Um, current activities are we're working very diligently on science integration. Um, so there's several different aspects of this. We do a lot of reporting. Um, Recover does a lot of reporting. All the different agencies do a lot of reporting. We are taking a hard look at how do we report, how can we best coordinate these efforts to not have duplicative efforts going on, and how can we report in such a way that, uh, say, the task force wants to see this information? You know, are you getting the, the information you really want and need, and does it help you in, in making your decisions? So that's a real big effort that's going on currently. Um, we've also had several meetings recently with the Committee on Independent Science Review of Everglades Restoration Progress. That was the, the group that was put together from WERDA 2000, um, and it looks mostly at CERT projects, but they've been, they've convened a new panel as well, and so we have discussed with them, um, because part of our group is Recover, um, you know, what are we doing in Recover? Um, and we're also looking at, at uh, you know, what is happening with the Southern Estuary. So our group of scientists serve not only their agency, they serve the science and coordination group. Some of them wear another hat and recover. So we're, we're a very well integrated group of scientists. Um, and under the SCG, we have the ability to leverage all of that expertise towards the, the many difficult um, questions that we need to answer regarding Everglades restoration. Next slide. And uh, with that, I, I turn it back to you, Ms. Chair. Thank you. Thank you both very much. I, I again appreciate learning about the various programs and projects that are going on. And part of my portfolio at the Department of the Interior is the water and science program. And it's great to be learning about these areas as well. 
I know um, we can move on now, I assume, to our next item, which is to uh, introduce, I have the opportunity to introduce Alligator Ron Bergeron. So I uh, look forward to your, your, um, in your introduction, sir. Well, it's a great honor for me to introduce uh, Mindy Parrott. Uh, Mindy Parrott is the South Florida principal uh, federal policy analyst working closely with our federal partners to implement the South Florida Ecosystem Restoration Program and Project. Uh, prior to this role, she was the lead project manager for the Western Everglades Restoration Project, Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands, and the Biscayne Bay and Southeastern Everglades Restoration Project. Mindy has been with South Florida Water Management for over 20 years with extensive experience in environmental restoration wetland policy. She has earned a bachelor's degree from the University of Miami in marine science and biology, a master's degree in coastal management from the Nova Southeastern University, and a graduate certi certified in sustainability and climate change from the University of South Florida. So it's a great honor to, to introduce Mindy. Thank you. Mr. Bergeron for that wonderful introduction. I am excited to be here with you to give you an update on what we're doing at South Florida Water Management District for surf and restoration strategies these days. Next slide, please. So Drew Bartlett and others talked great about um, the momentum we've got going on all of these projects and the results we're seeing. Um, just taking a look back at 2021, some of the highlights. Drew talked about the um, completion and removal of the old Tamiami Trail. Um, we also began um, using the FACA Union pump station, which is important for moving water south in the Picayune Strand area. Of course, there are huge milestones with the completion of the C44 projects, um, the core completing the reservoir and the district completing the STA. Um, and as others have mentioned, we've also began construction last year on uh, the eight and a half square mile limited curtain wall, as well as the C139 flow equalization basin, which I'll talk a little bit more about later in the presentation. Next slide, please. So on this slide, I've got a sample of the SERP and restoration strategies projects that are in the works at the district, of course, we um, all of these projects require extensive coordination with not only our federal partners at the core, but with our state partners and um, state and federal agencies to get them planned, designed, permitted, and constructed. So I've on the slide I've bolded the projects that are um, moving will soon be moving from one stage to another. For instance, we're all looking forward to the Lake Okeechobee Watershed Restoration Project. Um, Chief's report completed very soon and um, hopefully authorized in WERDA 2022. Similarly, I'm sure you'll hear more about these from um, Ava Velez in her update but we're looking forward to reaching the tentative selective plan for the Western Everglades Restoration Project this year and seeing the initial modeling results for the Biscayne Bay and Southeastern Everglades ecosystem restoration. On the design list, you'll see several projects bolded, which are the ones that will be moving to construction very soon. I also want to point out um, a couple of projects that are in the earlier stages but are very important to the districts. And one of these is the Locks River Restoration Project. Just a couple of weeks ago, the district approved the rule implementing the water reservations. And this is an important step toward the PPA, Project Partnership Agreement with the Corps. The district will be taking the lead on the Loxahatchee River starting with Flow A3. And right now we're working to get agreements and surveying 
and collecting information to support that design. Similarly, the district is also getting our ducks in a row to design and implement um, the C25 reservoir in STA in Northern St. Lucie County um, after, after acquiring that real estate uh, last November. And so uh, a lot of these other projects I'll be covering in later slides. So we'll just keep moving on. Next slide, please. So uh, several folks have mentioned the C44 reservoir and STA already. We're so excited about getting this project completing. Um, we, it, it is being filled, right? And we look forward to um, completing the operation testing and monitoring phase and um, having that reservoir and uh, turned over to the district for operation as soon as um, November of this year. Next slide, please. So here's a photo of the STA being completed and um, some of those cells being filled. Next slide. So one of the next steps in the C, I'm sorry, the IRL South project, the Indian River Lagoon, is the C23 to C44 interconnect. And this project is important because it allows for um, water that would normally harm in the middle estuary of the St. Lucie River um, to be redirected to the C44 project to improve uh, water quality and bring those estuary flows closer to natural patterns. The project is in final design and is expected to be awarded later this year and begin construction. Next slide, please. So moving over to the West Coast, the C43 West Basin Storage Reservoir, I can't communicate how big this feature is. It is enormous. It's over 10,000 acres and 170,000 acre feet of water, and it is well on its way, um, over 40% complete, with um, final completion expected in September of 2020. And on the um, figure, you can see all of the um, features that go into um, this type of reservoir and, and all the, the structures that are required to make it work. And so in the next slide, please, you can see some construction of the embankment going on. And in the following slide, you can see some of those internal structures coming to life. So moving on to the next project on the next slide. Oh, nope, so we're still on C43. So the, the S470, which is the inflow pump station for the C43 reservoir is actually getting very close to completion. And we expect that to happen in the next uh, few months. So moving back to Lake Okeechobee, the, um, the Lake Okeechobee Watershed Restoration Project Chief's Report will be completed soon. And I'm sure um, Ava Velez will be discussing that in her update. In the meantime, the district has received substantial funding for the ASR Aquifer Storage and Recovery Program for Lake Okeechobee and that extends through 2026. This funding is being provided to the district by the state to accelerate the ASR components, which are designed to provide reduction in harmful discharges to the St. Lucie and Caloosahatchee estuaries. Each circle on the map is a well cluster, which will have several wells, as well as a treatment facility, so that the water meets the appropriate standards as it is pumped into the ground. The program is being very thoughtfully and carefully executed step by step with the science plan to address the ASR uncertainties. Next slide, please. So one of those steps is continuous cores, which are geologic sampling of um, each location. And on the left, you see um, some of the uh, products of that investigation, the different um, drilling through the different rock formations. And on the right is a photo of one of the um, uh, field tests for the treatment technology um, proof of con concept testing that recently occurred. Um, the data which will be used to understand and 
and develop a recommendation on how to proceed with the testing. I mean, sorry, with the treatment for the ASRs. Next slide, please. So continuous cores are drilled uh, to sample the, the geologic properties at each, lo each location. And um, the, this slide shows some of the, that, dr that drilling work um, being conducted. These deep wells, um, which are around 2,000 feet deep, um, take many, many months to drill and um, later can be converted to ASR wells. Next slide, please. So moving south from Lake Okeechobee into the EAA um, is the A2 Reservoir and STA. The, um, these projects are very important to bring water south and treat it appropriately so we can feed the conservation areas and Everglades National Park with clean water. Construction is well underway for the STA and the inflow outflow canal, which are um, shown in yellow on the figure. And we expect that this work will be completed by uh, the end of 2023. Canal conveyance improvements for the Miami and North New River canals are in design, and that design is, in, is advancing. And um, the design is also advancing for the US, I'm sorry, the core led um, design for the A2 reservoir itself. Next slide, please. So here we have some great construction photos of the inflow outflow canal and levee construction, as well as some of the structures um, starting to um, come out of the ground for this, this project. Next slide, please. So moving south from the EAA is the South North features. Um, and as Drew Bartlett mentioned earlier, it's very important to um, get these features going as well because of their importance in redistributing the water more, um, more favorably within the conservation areas. The uh, district is moving out with the design on these features and we expect to award the contract for the first one, which is the X620 structure circled in green um, later in 2022. Next slide, please. So moving south um, toward the eight and a half square mile area um, is the uh, curtain wall, which addresses seepage to better water manage, manage water within the eight and a half square mile area so that water levels can be raised in Everglades National Park. This is 2.3 miles of wall that is almost complete. If you're looking at the diagram, the map on, on the right side, the orange line represents the um, curtain wall and it started near S357 North on the southeast corner and it moved around and now um, construction has at least reached the point of the red star and we project that construction will be completed very, very soon in the next couple of months. The next phase of the seepage wall, sorry, could go back, is the set new water seepage barrier, um, which will be five miles of additional seepage wall to the north of this location and will um, provide the similar benefits in enabling um, better seepage management and more water to stay in Everglades National Park. And the district is hoping to move to construction with this next phase, um, depending on the timing um, of the um, required documentation and permits for that activity. We hope that will start this summer, um, if not by um, later this year. Next slide, please. Also down south is the Biscayne Bay Cutler Wetlands Phase 1. I'm sorry, Biscayne Bay Phase 1 Cutler Wetlands Project. Um, design has been underway for some time, and we are very excited that contract 6A, which is the S701 pump station, is nearing completion of the design effort, and we expect to award a contract for that work and start construction um, in hopefully by September of 2022. 
the, the rest of the work, which will um, bring water from the C1 Canal to the mangrove wetlands and to Biscayne Bay uh, via a spreader swale and um, mangrove um, natural sheet flow. We expect the second contract to be awarded in FY23 and the project to be completed prior to 2025. Next slide, please. So moving from SERP to the Restoration Strategies Program, this map shows all of the features of restoration strategies, including um, additional STA footprints, STA improvements, flow equalization basins, which help um, better manage water deliveries to the STAs, and um, additional improvements allowing for improved conveyance. So I'm going to talk a, a little bit more about some of the ongoing construction. And if you're looking at the map, if you see the Loxahatchee Wildlife National Wildlife Refuge, the um, orange triangle just to the west of that is STA 1 West Expansion number two, which is under construction. So you'll see some pictures of that. Also, the um, Conveyance Canal in the central flow path is the purple line on underneath the word path. Yep, right there. And the C-139 flow equalization basin, which is in the western flow path, um, the blue feature, kind of at the southwestern end near STA-56. Yeah, right there. Thank you. <laughs> so moving to the next slide. There's a lot going on here, um, but this is just to show all of the deadlines with the restoration strategies pro projects and each check check mark is a deadline that we've met or exceeded. And um, there are a few projects still under construction and a few that are um, being uh, converted to operation, but we fully expect to um, meet our deadlines for this program. So next slide, please. So uh, if you remember that orange triangle to the west of Loxahatchee National Wildlife Refuge, these are some, this is some photos of that effort where we see the um, um, berms and other conveyance channels being constructed for that important expansion. Next slide, please. And some intake and inflow pumps for that work. And next slide, you'll see some outflow pumps. <laughs> and um, another part of restoration strategies on the next slide is improving conveyance. And these figures are of the Bold East Canal segment four, which is now complete. And segment five, which is the last segment, will be awarded very soon. So on the next slide, we'll see the C-139 FEB, which is a uh, feature that will store and improve deliveries of water to the STA-56, which is just to the, the east of that, that feature. Con construction is well underway. and. Um, we expect the FEB to be completed in um, July, around July of 2023. Next slide, please. So here are some wonderful construction photos of that work in action, from the building of the berms and digging of seepage ditches to constructing of the um, inflow pump station. So next slide, please. So as you can see, we are very busy with at the district keeping up the momentum of Everglades restoration. We're committed to getting these projects designed and, and constructed and uh, seeing those, those results that Drew was talking about earlier and, and making that vision happen. So thank you. 
Thank, thank you very much, Mindy. This was a great presentation and I really appreciate the scale, as you mentioned, of some of these projects. It's, it's nice to see all of the very cool pictures and also just to imagine how the pieces are fitting together. So it was great. Thank you. I'm happy to answer anyone's questions. Yep. Any anybody have questions or comments? I Everyone's equally this. odd, I'm sure. I do. This is uh, Ron Bergeron. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Well, yes. uh, first, I want to thank Mindy. That's a great presentation and to consolidate everything that she showed you there. We had 44 ribbon cuttings last year for projects starting and projects finishing. The momentum is fantastic. And Everglades Restoration, one of the largest, the largest environmental restoration in the history of the world is going forward. I wanna thank our governor and our legislators for their leadership. I wanna thank our federal partners and our state partners, agencies for their leadership as we continue to save one of the natural wonders of the world. And as we continue to go forward, I think it's important that the Everglades Task Force, as we evaluate the projects, uh, all projects are important, but what we have to do in, in my viewpoint is to make sure we're addressing the projects that stop the most irreversible damage first, since we have uh, decades to go to finish uh, Everglades restoration. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak and thank you, Mindy, for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you for the comments. Any other questions or comments? Okay, well, next up is a presentation from the Corps of Engineers. I know we're a little bit ahead of schedule, but looks like they're ready to go. Michael Connor, are you the person to introduce the subject or introduce so, the presentation? Madam Chair, this is Gib Owen. Mr. Connor just stepped away for a moment. Um, okay. So it, it's my, uh, my honor to introduce Ava Velez. Uh, many of you know her, she's a very familiar face, but this is her first task force meeting as a chief of ecosystem branch. And she'll be running us through the uh, progress that the Corps of Engineers is making. Take it away, Ava. Okay, excellent. Yes, Ava, please proceed. Good morning, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Owen, for the introduction. A quick sound check. Thank you for the thumbs up, I appreciate it. Thanks. I'm here today on behalf of the Jacksonville District team, as well as our South Atlantic Division and headquarters teams. We all work together with our partners at the South Florida Water Management District um, to execute this amazing program. And so I thank you for the opportunity to walk you through it. Next slide, please. I'm gonna focus my brief today on our execution. Our program, as you've seen today, is quite large. And I want to take a moment to thank Dr. Johnson for that incredible introduction to the program. It was an excellent video. And I wish that I, I had that context every time that I presented this program because it is so big. Um, and so I think Bob and I should, should go on the road together whenever we have presentations. I appreciate that very much. And thank you, Mindy, uh, for your presentation on our partnership. So ma'am and task force members and members of the public that are here with us today, I'm happy to talk to you about the work that the Jacksonville District team is doing in our um, program level activities, our planning, design and construction and operations. And I'm gonna show you how we are executing the FY22 budget and the infrastructure um, bill funds that we that were announced this year and how we're putting those to work right away. Next slide, please. So here's an overview of our budget. Uh, on the left side of that table there, you'll see the construction funds. 
um, starting with uh, FY21 and FY22. So an incredible amount for FY22 of $350 million for the president's budget. Um, that was also, of course, included in the omnibus bill. I want to uh, point out that the zero there for the work plan is just the placeholder. We really don't know what the work plan holds for FY22 for our program, but I wanted to have a placeholder there. And then the incredible $407 million for FY23 president's budget that was recently announced. At the bottom there, we received or was announced the $1.1 billion in the Infrastructure Investments and Jobs Act this year. And uh, next slide, please. I'll walk you through how that actually gets programmed um, in our work. This is, uh, for those of you that are new to our program, this is an excellent cheat sheet uh, to try to understand how we really manage this work and when we receive the funds and when we execute the projects how we uh, really do this. And so if you start on the upper right there and you see the Central and Southern Florida project, that is the framework. That is the original federal project there. And then from there, we have modifications uh, to that system by the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan uh, authorized in WARDA. And below that, you see a breakdown of the generations that Dr. Uh, Johnson described earlier today. And where um, you notice the generation one, two, three, or SEP, um, and then you've got the Loxahatchee River, and then the planning projects that we hope to uh, tee up for consideration by the Congress uh, in this year and in coming word of. And so uh, highlighted there in red are the five areas where the IIJA funds are being put to work uh, within our program, and that includes the IRL South project, the Broward County Water Preserve Area project, the SEP South phase, and then also the funding of the studies for Western Everglades Restoration Project and BBC or the Biscayne Bay and Southeastern Everglades um, Ecosystem Project. And, and so that's a nice high level overview of how we manage the work, how we execute it, and then where some of the funds went uh, with the most recent announcements. Next slide, please. One more. Thank you. The integrated delivery schedule is a living document. It is our strategic plan of how we make sure that we communicate to the public, our partners and decision makers, the breakdown of our work. It is a public uh, process that is updated annually when we receive new budget information as we've done, as we've received this year. And so on the right there, you see the process that we went through last year uh, for the 2021 update to the integrated delivery schedule. And we will be uh, initiating that process again here um, in August again with, for 2022. And what's interesting about the integrated delivery schedule is that if you look on the front page, and, and I thank uh, my friends at the OERI office for always posting our information on the evergladesrestoration.gov website. If you look at the front page of the integrated delivery schedule, you're able to see whether they're designated in blue or in black, who is leading the effort. So as you've seen today, Mindy Parrott and I are partners in the execution of the program. And there are some features which the Water Management District leads the engineering design and construction, and there are some features which the Corps leads the engineering design and construction, yeah. and the operations are done together. But on the front page, you're able to see um, every single feature that we have uh, authorized and in engineering design and construction and who the lead is. And then you're able to see a roll up of uh, the funding needed to execute that plan. On the back, you're able to see how the operations are needed to be updated in order to have use of the infrastructure that we build, as well as an understanding of the full suite of components authorized in 2000 by the Congress, which ones are already 
in design, which ones are in construction, and which ones yet have to be planned and taken back to Congress for consideration for construction. So I will come back to you in the summertime uh, with uh, working with OERI and the working group and science coordination group. And then when we uh, reconvene in October, um, I will do uh, a deep dive into the integrated delivery schedule update for 2022. Next slide, please. Lawrence Glenn already covered the amazing work that our Everglades scientists do as a team. And I wanted to take a moment to highlight Recover, restoration, coordination, and verification is one of our program level activities. And at the bottom where they have three major missions, assessment, evaluation, and planning. I want to celebrate that the scientists in Recover come from many agencies as well as our tribes. They work together and they help us set goals, track our progress, and we use their information every day in operation, in our planning, in our design. One example of that that I wanna highlight because I'll come back to it later, is that our recover team helped update the performance measure for the Lake Okeechobee stage envelope, meaning what is the preferred stage for Lake Okeechobee at different times of the year for its ecology. And that's information that we use every day, understand how the lake is doing, as well as we used it in the low sum effort. Look into the future, we use it also in our other planning efforts. Next slide, please. One more. Now moving towards the projects that, or the studies that we have ongoing together with the water management district so that we can identify a recommended plan together with the project delivery team, which is inclusive of our stakeholders and the public, to try to meet the goals and objectives of each project. So these are not yet authorized for construction by the Congress, but they are initiated or ongoing studies that allow us to continue to make incremental progress towards achieving the goals of the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan. So the Biscayne Bay and Southeastern Everglades Ecosystem Restoration Study uh, was initiated a little bit ago, and we have a very robust engagement with our project delivery team. Uh, many agencies and stakeholders in the public participate in our meetings. We have one coming up here in a few weeks. And the goals of the project are to restore the ecological conditions of the model land, southern glades, and coastal wetlands. We want to restore conditions in the near shore zones of Biscayne Bay, Card Sound, Barn Sound, and Manatee Bay. We want to improve hydrologic connectivity. And at the very last bullet day, I want to uh, really highlight it because BB Sear is innovative. BB Sear is thinking about how we can restore our ecosystem along our coast and recognize that they provide resiliency to our areas. And our scientists have helped us develop performance measures that take into account how sea level change in this most vulnerable area affects it now will affect it into the future, but how we can deliver fresh water at improved volumes and timing to help us keep those ecosystems resilient over time. So there's a timing aspect to it, to it and there's an understanding that there will be continued adaptation over time. And our scientists, our modelers, and our engineers, together with all of our stakeholders, are coming uh, um, to find solutions for this important and really complex problem. So I wanna make sure that I highlight the innovative work that our scientists are doing in BBC here as they develop alternatives for this future plan. Next slide, please. Indian River Lagoon South, as you've heard already today, 
is portions of it are already under construction and moving into operation, but there are others um, that are still in planning. And so wanted to recognize that here today, the map on the left identifies all the different features of the plan that was authorized by Congress. And what we're working on right now is a director's report for WARDA 2022 consideration so that we can update the total project cost of this important project while continuing to implement it. So the St. Lucie River and Estuary, the Indian River Lagoon are productive, important, nationally significant estuaries. And we want to continue our work as we continue to implement this project um, to improve how water is delivered to the St. Lucie and Indian River Lagoon, and then the quality of that water. So the planning portion of this is updating the total project cost. We have a director's report ongoing, and um, we hope to have it be considered under the Ward Act 2022. Next slide, please. Lake Okeechobee Watershed Restoration Project has uh, been with us for a little bit of time and, and we're thankful for the positive discussion so far today on this project. Um, the, the plan was updated recently and the proposed uh, recommended plan includes 55 aquifer storage and recovery wells and um, 4,700 acres of wetland restoration in Paradise Run, which is up there on the map uh, just in the northwest shore of Lake Okeechobee and Kissimmee, and then Kissimmee River Center, another 1,200 acres of wetland restoration. We have uh, released the draft project implementation report and environmental impact statement. That part is complete. We've taken all that input, are changing um, the report based on that input, and we will be releasing it again very, very soon, as well as uh, in preparation of the chief's report for consideration by uh, our chief of engineers, uh, General Spellman. We also uh, hope to have this be considered in WARDA 2022. Next slide, please. Western Everglades Restoration Project is a key planning study for our team. We are so excited that we were able to restart the study uh, a few months ago so that we can continue to advance the restoration of freshwater flow paths uh, in this important part of our ecosystem. And so the map on the left there identifies a very large study area. It's almost a thousand square miles. Um, and so very, very large, Western side. So if you're thinking from Lake Okeechobee down to Everglades National Park, uh, we know we're just to the left of that. And that system um, has timing that's been altered by the CNSF. And that results in increased potential for wildfires. Um, and so we really need to hold the ground a little bit wetter for a little bit longer so that we can improve the resiliency of that system. We also need to improve uh, some of the water quality and you know, of, of once we put it in the right place, uh, the water quality also has to be improved. And so I'm happy to report that I was just in this area last week, visiting with some of the landowners um, and understanding their perspectives as they are excited about the work and they uh, support the project and also want to understand how the project will affect their ongoing lifestyles within within it. So that's something that we try to do with all of our projects and, and it's of uh, significance in the Western Everglades Restoration Project as well. I want to thank the Seminole Tribe of Florida team for continuing to consult with us, um, especially as it relates to the Big Cypress Reservation and important areas within the reservation uh, that they want us to think about and include as part of um, traditional ecological knowledge. This is one of our studies where we are spending um, a lot of time with our tribal uh, members and our tribal staff to understand and incorporate traditional ecological knowledge into our planning, as well as into our adaptive management process. 
So I want to thank the Seminole Tribe of Florida staff for their efforts. And also, equally, I want to thank the staff and the members of the Miccosukee Tribe of Indians of Florida who have spent time with me and with all of our team uh, to make sure that we understand the priority that the Western Everglades Restoration Project is to them. And so they, um, I just want to make sure that I highlighted that for you today. Next slide, please. One more. Okay, the Army Corps of Engineers, we love yellow equipment. We love construction. Uh, and so I want to uh, spend a little bit of time uh, showing you what our amazing engineering team has done together with the South Florida Water Management District to position us to be able to execute all that funding that uh, we are receiving. It is because our engineering team works so hard to develop plans and specifications on time uh, that allows us to um, execute our construction contracts uh, at a time that that helps us use that important uh, funding. So for the C-111 South Dade project, um, this is actually already in operation. And it is one of the projects that uh, allowed us to update the operations plan in the southern part of the system. But in WARDA 2022, we received permission um, or approval to replace two important pump stations. And those are the S332 Bravo B and S332 Charlie C. And so, um, Marsha, if you don't mind pointing those out, they're in that kind of reddish uh, shading there in the sort of center. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Um, and so we are collaborating with the South Florida Water Management District on the engineering design for replacing those two pump stations, which are key to continue to provide the, the seepage management that allows that good fresh water to remain uh, within Everglades National Park and Taylor Slough, and then also make sure that uh, our neighbors uh, to the east receive um, the flood risk management as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so Picayune Strand Restoration Project. This is a really interesting one. We have a wetland restoration, 55,000 acres, and we have made progress uh, in construction here in a significant way. And I wanna highlight that the Army Corps of Engineers is so committed to completing this project that we've actually um, done this work with many different forms of construction. Uh, we have our own in-house heavy equipment team uh, doing some of this work. We have a design build contract ongoing for this, as well as we had a traditional design bid build contract. So we have multiple contracts, multiple teams uh, from the Corps doing this work. And um, we continue to stay uh, on track, uh, even though we have lots of interesting challenges that come up during construction. And, uh, and so kudos to our construction team for continuing to move this forward. We already see benefits, partial benefits of this work. Um, and uh, the more that we're able to uh, work on the Southwest conveyance features, um, the closer we will be to have a full implementation of benefits there and, and run those pump stations that are there on the north side uh, that are already complete. Next slide, please. So this is the construction part of the Indian River Lagoon South project. I uh, want to highlight there in design and engineering design, the C23, C24 North Reservoir. We are on track to award this contract Thank you for highlighting that shape there for the North Reservoir. Uh, this was funded fully by the IIJA funds, and we are on track to award in fiscal year 23. This is one of the five awards that Colonel Booth highlighted uh, earlier today, um, and uh, three of those are facilitated by the IIJA funding. We're also in design for the C23, C24 South Reservoir, and we are under construction for the C44 Canal Bank stabilization project that'll be done in just a few months. And then uh, the C23, C24 stormwater treatment area is fully under construction and, and doing quite well. Uh, Colonel Booth highlighted our groundbreaking earlier this year and our construction team uh, is doing very well in moving that forward. Next slide, please. So Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands Project, 
Um, this is one we do together with the Water Management District. Mindy mentioned the Cutler Wetlands, and so they're moving forward there. The Deering and State portion is already complete. And so there on the, on the bottom of that image, uh, you've got some pump stations that are going to deliver water in an improved way to the coastal wetlands um, along this cane bay. And so that's the part, the core it's constructing. It's the part that we anticipate to complete by 2024. And we've got the S709 pump station uh, being complete this year, which we will celebrate. And I hope that all of you can make it. And so this one's moving along quite well. We have four active construction contracts for Biscay Bay coastal wetlands. Next slide, please. Okay, so Central Everglades project is both in design and in construction. Uh, SEP actually has four phases, as we've talked about today. My status report uh, focuses on two because the Water Management District really leads SEP North. Uh, you know, we support in the continued um, coordination with them for uh, what we hope is a future project partnership agreement. And then um, for, for Step New Water, uh, they're also leading the effort for the seepage barrier. So the work that the, the Corps is leading uh, for Step South is uh, there are three structures along the L67A there. Uh, if you don't mind highlighting those for me, uh, we, will, we began this work and made some progress. Um, and uh, due to some construction challenges, are actually in the process of re-procuring that work. And so we expect that to restart this year. Um, there under Step South, wanted to highlight that one of the key elements of Step South is to make sure that when we redistribute that water and we stand on the shoulders of the foundation projects that are the Tamiami Trail bridges, that are the Steam 11 South Dave project, um, and we're able to make incremental progress to bring water uh, to Shark River Slough, that we also, as we go to the next increment for step south and we continue to reconnect the southern part of the system, that we also think about seepage management. And so pump station 356 is a key component um, in order to position our system to uh, receive all that new water that we're going to get uh, once the, the EAA reservoir is complete. And so pump station 356, final design is ongoing anticipated contract award for FY23 and was fully funded uh, with IIJA funds. In addition to that, we have a spillway called the S355 West, or uh, yes, S355 West, which is in preliminary design um, and uh, also anticipated to go to construction um, in FY23. And so that one is inside of the L29 there. It helps continue to bring, once the, the structures are complete and we're able to uh, bring water uh, from 3A into um, Shark River Slough, leveraging one of, the, one of the bridges that were recently completed, it will allow for better management of the canal that's along the Tamiani Trail to continue to incrementally improve how water gets into Shark River Slough. Um, and so that's that part of Step South. And then under Step EAA, uh, which is our largest project uh, to date. Um, the EAA Reservoir is a massive civil works project. It is 240,000 acre feet, um, and we are doing it in uh, pieces uh, so that we can continue to leverage uh, the funding that we've received. And so our portion of the inflow outflow canal is anticipated to start construction uh, very, very soon this year. Um, we also, our engineers have designed this, this dam and, and the foundation and the cutoff wall that goes with it um, so that we're able to complete the final design here really uh, this month and uh, anticipate being able to award this contract uh, this year. And then uh, for next year, we also have excellent progress in our engineering design for the embankment portions. Uh, we're currently in intermediate design and we anticipate awarding that contract in FY23. Next slide, please. Okay, so moving on to Broward County Water Preserve Area's C11 impoundment. 
this is also uh, one of our IIJA funded projects. So I, I mentioned we had three. This is this is the third one. Um, and so we had IRL South North Reservoir, uh, South 356 Pump Station, and then the C11 Empowerment Feature uh, funded uh, under IIJA. We are in final design for the C11 Empowerment. Uh, the purpose of this project is to reduce runoff from developed areas of the Western Broward County area, um, store them here, and um, improve conditions to the Everglades. Uh, it is also uh, connected to the full operation of Step South, so we want to make sure we keep it on track. Uh, thank goodness for our engineers and scientists uh, that are helping us do that and our funding from the Congress. Next slide, please. Okay, one more. So I want to congratulate all of you and wish you a happy new water year. And so many of you think of the calendar year or the fiscal year, um, but we think of the water year that goes uh, from the 1st of May through the following April. And so we have just made it through uh, water year 22. And um, the good news, as Mr. Bartlett uh, mentioned earlier today, is that we are seeing the benefits of our new infrastructure. Uh, we are seeing how um, new infrastructure gives us more flexibility to make good decisions with good data. And also we're seeing where we still need work, where we still need more projects to be built so that we can continue to incrementally achieve our goals uh, of the Everglades Restoration Program. And so from left to right there, um, I'm just showing you how the system is interconnected. Depending on who you are, you think of it differently. You know, if you relate more to the natural system, you might think of, of uh, Kissimmee River and our chain of lakes and the river itself. Um, if you're one of our water managers, our engineers, then you're thinking of the canals and water control structures that are make up the central and south Florida system. And really just wanted to point out that from the Kissimmee River down to Lake Okeechobee and into the water conservation areas, we are all connected. The people are connected, the environment is connected, and we're trying to continue to build infrastructure that allow us to operate the system in a way that is more beneficial to our environment. Next slide, please. And so uh, Kissimmee River restoration, as we highlighted before, the construction is complete. Uh, we're still doing some um, transition of some of that work. But what we've done for Kissimmee is an incremental plan for operations. Um, and so I wanted to let you know that the first increment uh, of the headwaters revitalization piece, which is the operational piece of the Kissimmee River restoration, is going well. And uh, we will do some additional NEPA, we will do some stakeholder engagement, and we will implement this um, in the coming year. And so we're gonna do it in pieces uh, as we have the system um, increase the storage up in the chain of lakes uh, that start with Lake Kissimmee. Next slide, please. Uh, we've all talked about the C44. I just couldn't talk about operations without mentioning it. Uh, how excited we all are. I was actually there last Wednesday uh, looking at the reservoir. Uh, it looks really, really good. It's about 10 feet deep and continues uh, to be tested. What I want to highlight here is that our system and our partnership recognizes that when we, when we build large infrastructure, we need to make sure we go through a testing period. And so I wanted to highlight that as part of our work, we do something called operational testing and monitoring period. Um, that officially allows us to uh, bring water in, make sure we take lots of data, make sure we allow opportunities for people to understand how it's working, and that that's what's going on right now with the C44. Next slide, please. So Lake Okeechobee, I'm going to switch back and forth between the Lake Okeechobee regulation schedule that we have in place now um, and how the lake is doing. And so one of the highlights uh, for Lake Okeechobee this year is that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that our scientists as part of RECOVER develop performance measures to help guide us, uh, to help us understand and, and make good decisions. And so the Lake Okeechobee stage envelope is one that was uh, provided to us by the scientists 
of uh, where the stage in the lake uh, could be or should be depending on the time of year. And so this year, Lake Okeechobee has been within the stage envelope, the preferred stage envelope since January. It has been in it all year. And so as we've collaborated with our partners at the Water Management District to release water from Lake Okeechobee in a beneficial way, we've been able to keep Lake Okeechobee within that envelope as the spring recession continues. Now that the, uh, the conditions are a little bit drier, um, we're seeing that the, uh, the rate of recession is increasing a bit, but that's mother nature. And, and so we're working uh, with that as well. Um, one thing I wanted to then point to the future is the Lake Okeechobee System Operations Manual, which uh, Tim Geisen will describe for you and brief you on in detail uh, in just a minute. What I wanted to talk about here is that we see LOSIM as a different perspective. Um, because we have the benefit of the Herbert Hoover Dyke rehabilitation, um, and we have additional infrastructure that's coming into play, uh, we are able to shift our thinking into benefits-focused water management operations for Lake Okeechobee. Um, Lores was more um, constraint thinking. We have a, a dike that needed to be re rehabilitated and, and the way that we uh, formulated lures was different than LOSIM. And so um, as, I, as I see that Tim is gonna talk to you about LOSIM in just a moment, what I wanted to leave you with is that LOSIM was formulated with a holistic perspective, thinking about the system. It was thinking about how we can share benefits, which is why it has a very, very large operational zone which doesn't send any water to the St. Lucie River estuary. It sends beneficial flows to the Coosahatchee and it allows for uh, a very large opportunity to continue to send water south to the Everglades um, longer than, than prior schedule, as well as it provides for improved water supply performance for uh, our uh, users within the Lake Okeechobee service area and for the Seminole Tribe of Florida. Another thing I'd leave you with is that we are looking at key seasonal assessments um, for the Lake Okeechobee System Operations Manual, which means that we are looking back to understand how the season has done and being able to then look forward to see where we would like to go uh, for the oncoming season. Next slide, please. So uh, I'm gonna close with uh, talking about the combined operations plan which is where we are leveraging the infrastructure built, meaning the bridges under the Tamiami Trail, um, the C-111 South Bay project, and others uh, to improve the water deliveries and, and the sharing of water between Water Conservation Area 3A and Everglades National Park while maintaining seepage management. Uh, that came in the form of a new way of thinking of how we move water, which is called the Tamiami Trail Flow Formula. And so we have those targets uh, that go well into the dry season. Um, next slide, please. So uh, lots of numbers on this slide. What I wanted to, to leave you with here is that if you look on the right on the totals and you go down, it's color coded. And so the pink or magenta uh, identifies when the combined operations plan was implemented, which was August or late August or beginning of September of 2020. And, and what I'll uh, note for you, uh, as we close out water year 2022, where you look at the full year of 2021 there, that you see numbers like 1.5 million acre feet or 1.4 million acre feet crossing the Tamiami Trail. And if you look above that same column, you'll note that um, the numbers are you know, historically less than that, but the, the next number that's pretty high was 2017, and there was a very large storm that year. Um, and so in 2021, we were able to deliver water to across the Tamiami Trail uh, in an improved way when our conditions, our rainfall conditions were actually below normal. And so one of the key uh, connections between the data and what we're seeing on the ground if you think about the image that Mr. Bartlett showed in the beginning where Shark River Slough was green all the way down to Florida Bay, um, you know, this is the math version of that. And so um, next slide, please. 
I want to thank you for the opportunity to brief you today and to give you kind of the high points of each of the phases of our program. And, and with, with that, I will take any questions you may have. Thank you so much. I, we, I would like to open it up for questions, but first I just wanted to say I'm tired uh, just hearing about all of the various activities you have going on. And I did have the opportunity to meet General Spellman last week when we were both testifying together at the House Appropriations hearing. So it's great to you know, hear even more about what, what some of these programs involve, what some of the projects involve. So I do see we have one hand as far as Kevin. Do you have questions or comments? Um, just some comments, thank you. Kevin Irwin, the County Commissioner from the West Coast. I've been on this task force for eight or nine years. Eva, thank you for your presentation. It's obviously a new day from some of the anxiety I went through back in 2018. I think Mads in the Lake has been significant and can't thank you enough for the recovery flows that we received. It's enabled us to do the lake. Um, the only question I have, is there an intent to update the IDS schedule, even with the historic funding that we received? Um, it's quite challenging in the next four or five years. The dollars that we need to stay on track are significant. And even if we funded the way we funded this last year, we still run into some real significant funding issues. So as someone that wants to go to Washington and advocate to continue to make sure we fund the IDS, I was just curious when we might receive an updated schedule. Thank you, sir. I appreciate the, the kudos to the team um, and also for the question. And so we will update the integrated delivery schedule in our public process beginning uh, in the summertime. Uh, and so that's just around the corner. We Great. will show the, the updated numbers uh, for this year and how that affects the, uh, you know, the next few years um, in terms of that top line number uh, as well. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, Nicole. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Ava, so much for that update and for um, giving us a, some insight into how the IJ funding will be distributed um, throughout the program. We're very excited to hear about these projects and um, again, how they're going to be prioritized into the integrated delivery schedule um, later this year. Um, I just want to particularly note a couple of things. One, NOAA is engaged and very much keeping an eye on the Biscayne Bay and Southeast East, uh, southeastern Everglades Ecosystem Restoration Project. Um, our downstream species are counting on their successes, and so um, we're here uh, to support and we'll be um, uh, cheering you on. Um, wanted to also thank you for sharing status and for noting the importance of timing in the BBC Air project. Um, uh, that's very important to us as well. And lastly, I just wanted to note um, that uh, NOAA and our interagency partners uh, earlier this year, mid-February, in fact, uh, released an interagency report on um, updated uh, in real time today, but also projections of sea level rise along our coasts. Um, and NOAA would welcome the opportunity to bring um, to you all um, a subject matter expert or two. Of course, this offer goes to other colleagues around the table. If you're not already connected to these data, um, and the best way to apply them in, in your work. Um, I would welcome an opportunity to get you connected with those folks. Thanks. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. I know we have some more presentations from the core coming up after our lunch break. Any other comments or, or questions? Okay, thank, thank you again. That's tremendous work that you're doing. Next up on our agenda is our public comment opportunity. And I would um, encourage folks to, to follow the rules that Sandy has 
laid out for us initially, and I think she will be able to guide us through, as I understand. Um, Sandy or Adam, is that correct? You are the moderator yes. for this sec yes. session? Okay. I'm on Great. the line with Sandy. So we encourage anyone who wants to speak to use the raise your hand uh, feature in Zoom, and please keep your remarks to three minutes or less. And the first hand that I see up is Irela Bade. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, not sure. <laughs> um, I'm the Chief Bay Officer for Miami-Dade County, and it's an absolute pleasure to see so much progress being made um, on the South Florida Water Management District side together with the Army Corps of Engineers. We are so pleased to have such a good collaboration and work with both um, agencies and look forward to many more ribbon cuttings. I again want to thank the task force for, you know, hosting workshops for Biscayne Bay and um, and the IDS. It's very important for the general public to understand and keep track of what's going on and 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 really the amazing progress that that's actually happening finally for Everglades restoration. So with that, it's just a big thank you to everybody across the board. Thank you. Are there any other? Uh, public commenters, please raise your hand now. So I see no other hands. Turn it over to me. So that concludes the public comment period, and I think we will return this afternoon at 1 10 p.m. I would agree. Uh, we're going to conclude uh, the morning session here. We're going to take a lunch break until 1 10 and get back on schedule with the agenda. Thank you.
Hi, Tim Geisen, can we do a mic check with you? Do it again, Hi, Tim. Can you hear me? Yes, good afternoon. Okay, now you're coming through. Thank you. Afternoon, everyone. Uh, we'll be starting here in one minute. Just another couple of minutes here, please. Thank you. Thank you. 
afternoon, everyone. Uh, hopefully, everybody had a nice lunch break. Uh, Tanya, wow, marathon race, right? We're getting started for the afternoon session. And uh, Chair, we are on uh, agenda item 10, uh, Lake Okeechobee System Operating oh. Manual. And uh, please, feel free to take it over. OK, well, thank you, everyone, for coming back. And it was nice to have a little break. I really appreciated the all of the presentations from this morning. And I confess that during our break, I moved over to the Colorado River Basin, where we were talking about some historic decisions and actions that we took today to address the ongoing drought situation. And so I am very happy to be back over here into the wet, uh, the wet world of the Everglades. And I appreciate next up on the agenda, we have the Corps of Engineers again, and I will look first for Mike Connor if he's around, great. If not, I know there are many, many of you who can take it to yes, it, uh, where it needs to go. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Mr. Connors is, is busy. So this is Gibb Owen again. Um, <clears throat> welcome back from lunch, everyone. As is uh, Just before we went to lunch, uh, Ms. Ava Velez gave us a little preview of the Lake Okeechobee System Operating Manual, the, the LOSUM work that, that Tim is the uh, senior project manager for. And with that, um, I'll turn it over to, the, to Tim Geisen. Thank you. Great, thank you, Gib. Appreciate that. So again, my name is Tim Geisen. I'm a senior project manager with the Jacksonville District, and be happy to be talking to you today about the Lake Okeechobee System Operating Manual, or LOSOM for short. Next slide, please. All right. So you've heard a little bit from um, everybody earlier uh, about the Central and Southern Florida Project, <clears throat> or the CNSF. Uh, it balances multiple uh, congressionally authorized project purposes, including flood control, navigation, water supply uh, for a variety of users, enhancement of fish and wildlife and recreation. And that's uh, a partnership that the Corps has with the South Florida Water Management District in, in this part of the state to operate the CNSF project. Next slide, please. Lake Okeechobee, as you may or may not know, is really the heart of the CNSF system. So Lake Okeechobee itself has been incorporated into the CNSF project uh, beginning back in the 1940s when it was first authorized. Lake Okeechobee, uh, surrounded by Herbert Hoover Dyke, which is also part of the CNSF project, um, is incorporated uh, as well in the 1940s as part of that effort. Uh, the Corps of Engineers, uh, we operate um, Lake Okeechobee, as well as um, operate and maintain the Herbert Hoover Dyke, um, as well as other parts of the CNSF system. The lake itself, as well as um, the, all the structures within the system, are operated and guided by a manual that's developed through a public process. And that's what we're going to talk about more in more detail here today, is that public process to develop the operating manual for Lake Okeechobee. Next slide, please. A little bit of detail, the uh, CNSF system has actually seven different volumes uh, of, of operating manuals that uh, provide guidance to our, our water managers um, on how to operate the system. So they include lake regulation schedules and operational guidance, which uh, provides context to the operators as they're making management decisions. Volume three, is Lake Okeechobee and the Everglades Agricultural Area. So volume three is what's being updated under the LOSOM process. Uh, next slide, please. So why are we doing this now? Or what are we doing? Uh, we're reviewing Lake Okeechobee operations. Um, it's something that's pretty complex um, and has taken us quite a bit of time. And I'll talk a little bit more about that process. Um, as we go, but it's a heavily uh, stakeholder driven, uh, I will say, and I want to kind of focus on that as we move forward, that stakeholder interaction. What will result in is an operational plan, which consists of a lake regulation schedule 
and operational guidance that in, informs the operators uh, when they're making management decisions. Uh, this effort is not recommending any new infrastructure, so it's strictly an operational effort uh, to update that operating plan. Um, as part of that, we for sure can identify some infrastructure concerns and, and highlight those, but then there are no new infrastructure uh, resulting out of this effort. Next slide, please. So why are we doing it now? So when the current uh, operating plan or what's called LORIS 2008 was developed in, in its recommendations, it determined that the lake regulation schedule should be revisited when um, one of two things happened. The Herbert Hoover Dyke rehabilitation was complete um, or comprehensive Everglades restoration plan projects C43 and C44 were complete. As it happens, we are nearing completion of both of those things, or I guess all three of those things. Uh, so as we, as was recommended, the, the core decided that we jump right in and get a head start on developing the operations uh, for the lake to take into account this new infrastructure that would be built uh, and, and get our uh, effort, LOSOM, done at the same time so we could come online with a new operating schedule as soon as that infrastructure was ready. Um, in addition, we also received in Word of 2018, um, some words of encouragement, if you will, uh, to go ahead and expedite this effort to, to complete the um, LOSOM in conjunction with the completion of this construction. So it was a great, great time to start and, and we've needed every bit of the time that we've, we've taken to this point uh, to work with all of our stakeholders. Next slide, please. All right, so a little bit about our process. We kicked everything off in 2019 um, and will be finished up in early 2023. So we've taken a, gone through a full uh, phased planning approach to developing these new operations, starting with um, our scoping effort back in uh, February and March of 2019. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. Uh, we went then went through a very detailed formulation process uh, to develop uh, performance metrics to evaluate uh, the different plans that we were going to come up with, as well as to formulate the initial alternatives. We then undertook a very extensive alternative evaluation process to narrow down to the uh, preferred lake schedule uh, plan that we have now. And we're now working through the documentation uh, process to get towards the, uh, the decision and the signing of a record of decision um, later or early next year. Next slide, please. All right. So as Ava mentioned, we have a widely varying group of stakeholders that are very sophisticated in, in the state of Florida and especially in South Florida um, when it comes to understanding the water resources that we have. Uh, and depending on where you are in the state, on which side of the lake, you may have a different interest in the water that uh, is moving in and out of Lake Okeechobee. And taking into account all of those different perspectives has been um, one of our real big focuses since the beginning of, of LOSOM uh, back in 2019. And uh, working with all those stakeholders to really understand their perspectives, where they're coming from, um, educate everyone on, on how the water resource system works. Uh, it's been part of our challenge, but also uh, to me, one of the biggest benefits that uh, the LOSOM process has really provided to us is getting all of that communication going and getting everybody on a, a, the same playing field when it comes to uh, understanding how the water resource system works. And then uh, with everybody on that same playing field, even if they don't necessarily agree with other perspectives, they at least understand um, the different perspectives that everyone has. So it's been a really, really cha big challenge, but also a really big success within LOSOM is all that stakeholder coordination. Next slide, please. So this just kind of highlights um, what that, that stakeholder engagement has really looked like throughout the process. And as I said, we're now into the draft NEPA documentation, which is over on the left side here, um, getting towards the end. But starting with scoping, we've really tried to engage a very robust uh, communication plan and working with our stakeholders. So that started off with 10 public meetings 
uh, in February and March of 2019. And we received over 8,000 comments from that, that uh, scoping period. Uh, we held those meetings all around Lake Okeechobee, uh, north, south, east, and west, all the way down into the Keys. Uh, so a lot of, lot of comments early on, which has, have really shaped the uh, goals and objectives of, of LOSOM, uh, and we've continued that uh, throughout. So since that time, we held uh, six educational webinars over the summer of 2019 to try to get that uh, common understanding of the system out there, give everybody that, that good base to start the, the discussions on LOSOM and lake operations. And that's continued throughout the, the rest of the process. Uh, we've held over 20 uh, project delivery team meetings um, since late 2019. Um, numerous workshops and listening sessions where we've collected feedback uh, throughout the process and really taken a, a lot of time in uh, our sub teams as well to work on, in, on a technical level uh, with all of the stakeholders. Uh, and that's continued right up into the point where we are now, where we had, had just shared some draft language on the operational guidance with the stakeholders and received feedback on that, which we're working diligently to incorporate into our draft NEPA document in that draft uh, operating manual. So a very robust process, uh, uh, very beneficial to the overall uh, effort into getting us to where we are now. We've made um, every effort to try to be open and transparent and really take in the feedback that we're getting and provide back to the stakeholders how we're incorporating their feedback. Uh, so I think that's gone extremely well uh, in such a complex environment. I think it's been very beneficial. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so as I mentioned, that stakeholder communication uh, early on really helped us develop our study goals and objectives. Uh, so real quickly, our, our study goal is has been to incorporate flexibility in the way we operate Lake Okeechobee while balancing this congressionally authorized project purposes, which you see over on the right side of the screen. Um, our study objectives focus around those processes. Uh, we have four objectives, each which has sub-objectives, uh, which we have metrics to measure and uh, helped us to get to the selected plan, which we think creates a, a really good balance of these objectives um, across the system. Uh, objective one is to manage our risk to public health and safety, life and property, which in the past has really been focused on dam safety, and that's still a, a, a key focus. We've also incorporated algal bloom risk into the process and how the operations that uh, we're developing in Lake Okeechobee and how the management decisions are made can affect uh, or, or really help to uh, lessen the risk to the downstream communities that receive water from Lake Okeechobee. Objective two is to continue to meet the authorized purposes for navigation, recreation, and flood control. Uh, those are our goals we're already really reaching with our current operations, and the, the key was to not change those or not make those really any worse than they already are um, without necessarily focusing on a, a big improvement, but uh, naturally as you improve other things, you will see improvement in uh, objective two. Objective three is to improve water supply performance. That's a, a big one, and that's not uh, just for agricultural and municipal users, but that's also for the environmental uh, areas, both on the coast and in the Everglades, which count on water from Lake Okeechobee uh, to enhance their uh, ecology. So that was a, a big goal of LOSOM, is to better distribute the water that we have and, and really try to supply that to the, the users, uh, both environmental and uh, man. And then objective four is to enhance the ecology in Lake Okeechobee, northern, the northern estuaries, which are St. Lucie and Clusahatchee, as well as Lake Worth Lagoon, uh, and then also across the entirety of the South Florida ecosystem. Big challenge, but I think where we are now, uh, which we'll see on the next slide, gets us to a really uh, a better balance than the, the current lures operations that we're under. So this is a look at what the lake schedule uh, looks like for LOSOM. And just a couple of the key highlights, um, you'll see right in the middle where it says flows south. Previous schedules have uh, kind of cut off the flows as you get lower into the, the schedule. Uh, and that's really when, when the Everglades needs that water uh, as you get into drier times. So 
Our LOSOM schedule allows flow south throughout the entire operating band, all the way down to uh, water shortage management, uh, which the state uh, controls that and, and makes sure that the water users are still getting um, out an allocation at that point. But the, the key is that that flow south is now available throughout the operating um, regime, which is a big improvement over previous schedules. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the water deliveries to the estuaries is also a really big um, topic of discussion throughout this process. And this schedule uh, really looks at providing beneficial water to the estuaries when they need it. The St. Lucie estuary does not desire any water. So our schedule throughout the, the really wide zone D, which most of the, the year is spent in that zone, does not release any water to the St. Lucie estuary, uh, which is a, a goal of um, the stakeholders on the East Coast. Uh, so I think this is that's a big improvement over previous schedules, which were always making at least some releases from Lake Okeechobee to that coast. On the West Coast, uh, where they do desire water, just not too much of it and at the right times, this schedule looks at keeping the, the flows in zone D uh, to a beneficial level that is desired by the estuary to keep it in, in good health. So that's also a, a big improvement over previous schedules. Um, so those are kind of some of the, the, the big highlights. And in all of this, spending more time in zone D and making really uh, smart decisions with the water has been the, the goal of LOSOM. As I mentioned, that operational flexibility that's really focused on taking the water that is in the system and looking at system conditions. Where is the water needed? Um, what have the conditions been in the past? What are they now? And what are the projections going to be uh, for the near future? And making smart management decisions with the water that we have available, getting it to the places that need it and trying to keep it away from places when they don't want it. Uh, so all of that has gone into the development of the schedule, which uh, on the next slide we'll take a look at how it's a little bit better than what we're doing currently. As I mentioned, that LOSOM is really benefits focused. Previous schedules, especially with LORS, were really focused on risk reduction um, for Herbert Hoover Dyke during construction, um, but also more on risk within the system. We're now shifting the focus. And again, that stakeholder feedback has really kind of geared the, the priorities of, of how we're managing the lake to where we are today. And that's really looking at benefits. How can we provide the most benefit to the most people in the system with the way we manage the lake? Uh, as I mentioned, we're, we're looking at the system in a holistic perspective. It's not just what's going on in Lake Okeechobee. It's what's going on around the system. What are the climate conditions? What have they been? Where? What are we looking at as far as projections in the future? Um, and, and looking at where um, the best use of the water that we have available can really be made at any one time and, and taking a very serious look at that holistic perspective um, of moving water in and out of Lake Okeechobee. And then that last bullet is really kind of the key is utilizing that real time knowledge of, of these different items, climate conditions, weather uh, projections and, and what's going on in the system to make educated decisions on how we make releases. And that's really kind of a different way of, of doing things than we've done in the past. And as I said, it's really it's all about the benefits and having flexibility to adapt the management um, decisions to the current uh, the current system conditions uh, and make those things really align. Next slide, please. All right. So this is uh, now moving from the schedule itself into some of the uh, the water management guidance uh, that's captured in the manual. Uh, and these are some of the things that are listed here are, are, are items that will be looked at on a weekly basis as we're making management decisions throughout the year. Um, and this is not a, a fully comprehensive list. These are just uh, examples of the things that would be looked at. And we have a, an ability to really look at a, a much wider array of information to really understand the system status and, and where the water is most beneficial. Um, and again, this includes climate conditions, uh, water supply conditions, conditions of the ecosystems that are receiving the water, uh, the lake conditions itself, 
Conditions for harm, harmful algal blooms. Are there blooms ongoing in the lake? Are th is there a high risk for blooms downstream if we make releases? Taking into account that type of information. Looking at the stormwater treatment areas, uh, can they handle more water or do they need a break? Um, looking at the, the water conservation areas, Everglades National Park, um, as well as MFLs in different parts of the system. So it's really a comprehensive way to look at um, not just Lake Okeechobee, but the, the systems that Lake Okeechobee interacts with in, within the CNSO. Next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned uh, on the, the previous slides, the flow south um, are available throughout the entire um, operating band all the way down to that water shortage management line. Uh, and that's really a big focus is trying to get as much water back to the Everglades as we can. Uh, that's where it historically would have gone and that's where uh, it's most needed. Uh, so that's a big focus and a big improvement of the low SOM over previous schedules. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so this slide's really key because it's part of that overall uh, system approach to management. And that's really taking uh, really key times throughout the year and looking at the philosophy uh, from releases at those times and assessing system conditions. So you can see on this slide, there's three stars uh, at different points in the year, one in the middle of the dry season, one at the early wet season, and one uh, at the end of the wet season, early dry season. So these are really key times uh, when how water's uh, being held or released in the lake um, you can really make good management decisions based on seasonal assessment where things are and determine what's the philosophy going to be as we move into the next part of the year. So the idea would be that at these times we would engage um, all of our stakeholders to assess the system and really understand what the, what the keys are as we move from one uh, point to the next. Uh, and, and determine how what our, kind of our overall goal uh, during that time would be for lake management. Uh, as I said, stakeholder uh, engagement and feedback has been key during the development process, but that doesn't stop once we have an approved uh, manual and start implementation. That continued feedback um, with stakeholders, that continued discussion is key to um, successful operations as we move forward. So that's, we've established that during this uh, process to develop the plan, but that will continue as we move forward with the implementation of the plan itself. Um, next slide, please. All right, as I mentioned, um, we have the lake schedule and the operations that go with that. And that's kind of how we would typically manage, but there are some additional uh, components that are included, some additional tools in the toolbox uh, that are available uh, for us to utilize when appropriate uh, and in coordination with stakeholders. So one of those is looking at algal bloom uh, risk and, and um, HAB operations. And the intent is to have the ability in our uh, decision-making process to take in data, uh, whether it be field data, um, remotely sensed data, uh, and recommendations from the state agencies whose directive is to uh, manage uh, water quality and, and, and whatnot on a daily basis, take into account that information uh, as we're making management uh, decisions and adjust uh, as needed to try to lower risk um, for either um, increasing or causing blooms downstream uh, as we make releases. So this is a bit different than, than what we've done in the past and the ability to incorporate this uh, information and make good decisions based on real world operations is just uh, one way that uh, that theme has been manifested in our toolbox that we have. Next slide, please. Lake recovery is another tool that's not hard coded into the schedule, but is available uh, when it's needed to try to provide uh, beneficial operations for lake health. Um, so lake recovery uh, would be employed when we know, when we have uh, stages that have been high for a long longer period of time. So higher stages in the lake uh, above those that are desirable. 
have a negative impact on submerged aquatic vegetation and the overall ecosystem. So understanding the, that status of where we, where we are, where we've been, and what the projections are moving forward for, um, for climate will allow us to take into account the health of the lake and do some um, operations to benefit lake health as needed. Uh, so this lake recovery operation um, is that tool that allows us to do that. Uh, bringing the lake down to stages uh, that can allow recovery of that submerged vegetation and enhancement of that ecosystem. And again, this is done in coordination with our stakeholders to determine um, when it's desirable and when conditions are ripe to employ an operation like this. Next slide, please. And <clears throat> Lastly, uh, a, a big uh, consideration within LOSOM is how we work with the state of Florida in, in determining water supply deliveries. Um, as you may know, the, the state is the responsible party for making those uh, water supply allocations. And our intent is to work very closely with the state in continued partnership and make really smart decisions uh, based on recommendations that the state can provide, especially as we get lower into lower lake stages when uh, water shortage becomes uh, a much more risky proposition and something that we have to really pay attention to. Uh, so this language is kind of is, is um, would be included in our water control plan to kind of uh, lay out that interaction between the, the core and the state uh, when it comes to water supply deliveries. Uh, it's been something that's very key to our stakeholders, uh, especially on the water supply side, but also from the environmental stakeholders who are very concerned also about making sure that we uh, get the deliveries right, uh, get the water where it's most needed. And this is just another tool um, that's part of LOSOM that helps us all get to a, a beneficial operation of Lake Okeechobee in the overall system. Next slide, please. And the last slide uh, before we get to questions, just kind of the overall process again and where we are. Um, we're in the, as I mentioned, developing the draft environmental impact statement and the draft um, operating manual. Uh, that's in process now and should be available for, for uh, review uh, within the next couple of months. Um, and then, as I mentioned, a, a, a final approval with a record of decision um, that will come out of the South Atlantic Division um, in Atlanta in early 2023. So that's where we are. Uh, hopefully that wasn't too much of a, an overload and uh, welcome any questions that you have now. Thank you very much, Tim. Does anybody have comments or questions from the task force? Nicole. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Tim, uh, for that presentation and for all the hard work that the Army Corps is doing. Um, it was good to get an update on LOSOM schedule. Um, as you probably know, the Army Corps and NOAA are close partners on a number of uh, restoration activities, including engineering with nature. I'm absolutely heartened to see the Corps um, continuing to have a very high standard for information um, to make informed decisions about Lake Okeechobee, Okeechobee um, for example. Um, I strongly encourage you and the Corps to continue your work with us um, to guide your restoration efforts in ways that are climate ready. Uh, for the first time in human history, um, as you may well know, we are compelled to design our traditional and nature-based infrastructure projects not simply for the conditions of the day, but for future conditions. And you noted climate conditions several times in your presentation. Um, so I would um, continue to offer uh, NOAA's expertise related to sea level rise, subsidence, um, marsh migration, seagrass uh, movement, um, things that we can control through our efforts, but um, many elements of the future we will not be able to control. So we have much data and expertise we can share with the Corps, um, particularly also on harmful algal blooms, uh, which you also mentioned. Um, Dr. Rick Stump from our National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science is always available for consultation as well. Um, thank you so much again for the presentation and the updates. You're welcome. OK, 
Okay, any other questions or comments? Thank you, Tim, very much. And thank you to all the core, uh, the presenters from the Corps of Engineers. It was a lot of information and can tell you have a lot going on. I know you're lo looking forward to a lot more with your new bipartisan infrastructure funding that supplements the existing funding that you have. So appreciate all of the work going on there. Next up, we have a report on WERDA 2020, the Invasive Species Risk Assessment, Prioritization and Management. And Adam, it's my understanding I turn this over to you to give us a briefing. Yes, ma'am. Uh, it's a little bit more than a briefing. We're going to be uh, <laughs> uh, we're going to be uh, working on a decision here to push the working group and science coordination group out on mission to address the language in WERDA 2020. 2020. And so, um, you know, invasives have been a part of my work history since I started back in the 90s at Biscayne National Park. Um, it's something that uh, there has been a lot of traction in the recent years and, and uh, getting more formalized as time goes forward. So we're going to be working towards that through this presentation. And, and I look forward to uh, the discussion and, and see what the outcome is of our presentation here. So, um, if we could move on to um, the next slide. The, uh, the framework was originally um, addressed uh, by Assistant Secretary Estenos, who was the director of the OERI um, back in completing it in 2015. In, in, advance, of, in advance of this, this discussion uh, that we anticipated was gonna happen a little bit sooner, but hasn't, and we're doing it now, which is great. Um, the, there's been several updates to the framework um, and a collaborative effort of multiple agencies that are here on the call. And this allows us to um, discuss um, discuss and frame up this, this large topic and how to address that and interface uh, one another um, and helps us to improve in, uh, invasive species uh, coordination. Next slide. Um, so the, um, it's a framework to help us improve invasive species coordination. Uh, help decision makers uh, understand the connections between the goals and strategies, uh, identify the priorities. Um, there are four phases of um, the evasion curve that you see here. And again, this helps us to try to box these up. Obviously, things want to, we want to try to do uh, conduct uh, our business in relationship to exotic invasive species in the prevention mode. Because as you move to the right and time goes on, the costs go up. And so we break this down and, and this is what the strategic action framework does. It, it shows us that the prevention is where we would like to be. Eradication is the next best stage containment. And then the more expensive resource protection and, and long-term management. And uh, so this is how we, we discuss this. Now, this is not something that we is solely going on here in South Florida. Um, this is going around the country, around uh, the world, in invasive species and altering our landscapes and um, preventing us in some ways and shapes and form of achieving some of our goals. Next slide, please. So this is a kind of a, a brief screen capture of some of the tools that have already been developed by the state and, and collaborative agencies. Um, tools to help us evaluate um, the uh, densities, and, and these are basically, you have a vegetation, Brazilian pepper, which is commonly found and grown here in, in South Florida, uh, where everything likes to live because of our climate. And then uh, an, an emerging um, invasive uh, reptile, black and white pegu. So these circles aren't just specific locations, but these are specific areas with the number of occurrences where we've had removals, uh, Brazilian pepper, pepper, or in relationship to the tegu, where we have had captures. Um, and so in the case of the black and white Argentine tegu, uh, there are a lot of um, indi uh, individuals or um, they're, they're moving out of the state of Florida because they can tolerate uh, cooler climates. Um, and it's just an example to show you how intensive this is, but there are maps for and generations and um, for this EDD maps and maps uh, program, along with other online available tools. Next slide. The strategic action framework, again, um, it includes uh, its, um, its complementary resources, um, the 2020 progress report, 2020 priorities, 2020 case studies, 
and 2019 uh, uh, snapshot budgets. Um, these are all the things that we work towards updating it. Yet again, there has been a lot of information that has been uh, gained uh, in order to achieve uh, our goals and, and what direction comes out of this, this meeting here. Um, there's rulemaking and policy changes that have occurred uh, that, that are being uh, worked on all the time. Um, and then the priorities document is uh, results of a few changes in priorities, priorities since 2015 uh, and, and so forth. Um, case studies, they the added in nine case studies developed by the experts to highlight efforts and lessons learned. Um, again, the investments that the annual budgets and funding uh, from the participating agencies uh, and how it, it fits into the invasion curve. Next slide, please. So the priorities here, uh, it's uh, helpful to determine how many of the 2015 uh, priorities have been tackled and accomplished. Uh, the review uh, helped to pave the way for this 2020 priorities effort. The results indicated that implementation in, of the initial 2015 priorities should continue while enhancing the prevention tool developed and capacity building. Next slide. So the, the priorities uh, for, for prevention, um, we're approving the horizon scanning, looking out for incoming and you know, inbound uh, species that are coming into our ports of entry or through other, other, other means. Um, pests arriving through trade, uh, expanding efforts. Again, as I said, at the ports, Fish and Wildlife Service state is uh, at our ports of entry, watching for these, uh, these um, you know, invasion uh, species, whether it be plants or animals. Um, and also those plants and animals can be exported to other portions of the country, causing harm, not only here in South Florida, but in, in, other, in other parts of the country. Um, and continuing coordination between partnering agencies. Next slide. So the, the framework is the, the most recent effort. Um, this 2020 uh, action is um, task forces to develop. So let me restart. The Water Resource Development Act is as a result of an initial slither act that morphed into word of 2020 uh, section 504 and it was renamed the Invasive Species Risk Assessment Prioritization and Management. Uh, what it does is it amends the original 1996 word to add specific duties to the task force related to invasive species. Um, we could go through this, it reflects an assessment of ecological risk uh, that the listed invasive species represent. It includes uh, populations of invasive plants and animals, um, uh, significantly impacted the structure and function of ecological communities, native species, and habitat within the South Florida ecosystem, um, and uh, demonstrate a long potential, uh, strong potential to reduce and obscure otherwise alter key indicators used to measure Everglades restoration progress. Um, there is a second part to this. Next slide, please. So uh, we just discussed this. Um, the first part of this is what, what goes behind the developed in the priorities list. And, and part two, um, which you all could choose to direct us to, to take the time right now to begin to roll out on as well uh, and report back uh, in, in the, for the October event. Um, and when I say us, I mean the working group in the SCG um, and to, to also take on the application of the priorities list, which may be a little bit bigger task, but, but we'll see when we get there. Um, it's applied to, uh, to a priority list of invasive species uh, used by the task force and agencies and entities represented by the task force to focus on the collaborative efforts, uh, guide the applied research, develop innovative technologies, uh, implement specific management, control and eradication activities, um, and uh, neutralize the impacts of listed invasive species. Uh, develop innovative strategies and tools to prevent future uh, introduction of non-native species. Um, you know, I, I know from a federal perspective, and I know the state is, is heavily leaning into this uh, effort. USGS, uh, you know, is, is spending time investing in, in pythons uh, you know, as we speak. I wouldn't be surprised if this topic is on the, uh, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission agenda for the next over the next two days. It's a topic that is constantly and continually being um, elevated to the next level, to the next level. And, 
and it's been elevated in order 2020 to the task force here to to work on this so um anyhow um next slide please so anyhow this is the uh the final slide uh madam chair in, in regards to the task force recommendation uh, that 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 is being proposed at this time and is up for your consideration and the others uh, here at uh, members of the task force and discussion. And if you have any questions, please uh, let me know and I will do my best or reach out to some of the team here. Over. Okay. It sounds like, uh, excuse the uh, interrupt. Oh, no, no, sorry, you sometimes have to step away. Hi. <laughs> No, I'm I'm here. I was waiting Great. for any hands to come up or comments. Yeah, gotcha. I don't see any. I know um, this is a subject oh. that you are uh, focused on for very, very, very good reasons. And <laughs> I know we want to try to, uh, I, I think it's important for us to try to lead and have a, an important role in guiding the task force or, or helping us along with making sure that we are able to make progress and meet, meet the requirements that we have in this area. Thank you, Madam Chair. I see that uh, uh, Mr. James Erskine okay, has his hand up. James. Thank you, Chair. I, I would just like to start by thanking, thanking some of our state representatives, Governor DeSantis and the, our commissioners you're right, Adam, this is a large topic of our commission agenda over the next two days and has been on many commission agendas. Um, I'd like to thank them for allowing us and really pushing our agency and our staff to be leaders in non-native wildlife management. In addition to that, I'd like to thank our federal representatives for showing that this is an issue that is not only not bi bipartisan, but it's an issue that affects all of our ecosystems. Um, with that being said, Florida is susceptible to inv invasive species and more than 500 non-native fish and wildlife species have been recorded in Florida. At least 139 of those species are established and reproducing in the wild. And many of the most notorious invaders like Burmese pythons and Argentine black and white tegus have taken up residence in the South Florida ecosystem. The, this legislation here is an opportunity to build upon the extensive list of conditional prohibited non-native fish and wildlife that the state regulates under chapter 68-5 FAC and the rule was significantly updated in 2021 to include prohibited reptiles and our staff briefed the working group and science coordination group on those changes in May of 2021 at the joint meeting. So I would encourage the task force as both the working group chair and as serving today as Florida's advisor as an advisor for fish and wildlife to continue to meet the challenge of invasive and exotic species head on. And I can attest the ability of the working group, the science coordination group, to really take this on and take it to the next step. Thank you, Chairwoman. Thank you, Mr. Erskine. Mr. Bergeron. Yes, I, I think this is uh, extremely important in, in order to have a <clears throat> healthy uh, food chain, to have a healthy environment, the invasive uh, uh, exotic and the exotic plants and animals, we have to continue to remove them out of the uh, Everglades and so our native wildlife uh, can survive. And it's ex extremely important. And I would like to back up uh, and have a few comments on Losum, uh, uh, mainly for the public to understand and maybe some of the members that aren't uh, that familiar, a little bit of a layman's connection here of Losum is, is really try to balance the impacts uh, to Lake Okeechobee minimize the discharges uh, quantity of water greater than natural that's affecting the estuaries in the Gulf and the Atlantic. Uh, and as we bring more reservoirs on to store the water that laid on the half of the Everglades, 
that we drained starting in 1948, uh, our bathtub is half the size. So Losum has really tried to balance with minimum discharges into the Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico uh, and be able to, uh, until we get, it's not the answer to all, but I think it balances uh, as we build more of Everglades restoration. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, as, as I mentioned, and as we know, there's no doubt this is an important topic for us. Adam, is there, do you need additional direction or is there anything that we need to do during this meeting to ensure that we can stay on track with this work? Um, I think it's just seeking uh, any opposition to okay. uh, pushing out the uh, working group and science coordination group in my office to uh, advance this uh, and, and rapidly addressing uh, the word of 2020, ma'am. Okay. I can't imagine that anyone objects, but we know it's important work and that it's not easy either. So. We, we assume that as well, but to know if there was any special direction from any specific member that would maybe yep. move our cheese a little bit around and give us some additional guidance from their agency's perspective and add some color to, to what we have here in Warda, right? And so this is that opportunity to kind yep. of um, work within the framework of Warda 2020, and that's for the discussion here. That's the discussion that we've had uh, leading up to this um, here within the working group and science coordination group to take the pulse of the task force and the agencies uh, to see how this moves. Thank you. Okay. Well, I don't, I don't see any additional hands. So I know we all appreciate the effort that you've been making in this area. And okay. I'll, I'll take the liberty of urging us to keep, keep, keep the pressure on for sure. Happy. Correct. We will take this uh, direction uh, back and and, um, and advance it as directed. Okay. Thank you. Yep. And then next, I think we're in the second round of public comment. Is that correct? Yes, we are. So once again, anyone wishing to speak, please use the raise your hand feature in Zoom. And please remember to limit your remarks to no more than three minutes. Okay, I don't see any hands going up, so I think we have no public comments. Okay, we can go out and uh, continue towards the wrap up of the meeting. I appreciate everyone being on and we have a section of assignments, next steps and closing comments. I know one thing to announce is our next meeting date, which we have scheduled for October in Washington, DC. I am very, uh, October 19th is the date that I, my notes indicate. That is we correct. Are, we are very happy to be able to host that meeting. I think um, none of us anticipate that that's going to prevent us from being able to go down to Florida and to, to see some of these projects firsthand for those of us who haven't. I know I wanted to recap some of the comments that we did here today. I am again honored to be able to be the chair of this group of this task force and look forward to learning about the environment there. I am looking forward to working with our new vice chair, Secretary Hamilton. It will be great to again, learn more about everything going on down there and uh, the federal family partners that we have. We look forward to continuing to strengthen the ongoing coordination. I know the, we did hear comments from um, many, good, many good presentations on many issues. 
the issues relating to um, invasive species that we just heard, the challenges associated with the coral reefs, the challenges associated with trying to manage in an un, um, unprecedented situations for, for storm systems and, and weather systems is something that is on all of our minds, I know. Um, I am happy to be able to just continue to push forward, like we said, on all of our ongoing activities. The, um, I know as I imagine our routine is to circulate notes for these meetings or, you know, happy to take guidance, Adam or Sandy for any additional wrap up steps that we normally do. Oh, you did a great job, uh, Madam Chair. Um, things are going well. Obviously, this is also being captured on the uh, EvergladesRestorationGov uh, 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 YouTube channel, okay. um, and, and the team will be having uh, information available and, and the transcripts available um, and, uh, upon request and, and very easily provided. Um, the, uh, the, the new vice chair, Secretary Hamilton, had to rapidly depart us uh, the meeting at around noon, or else he would be able to provide some uh, some additional commentary. Um, I, I'd like to also just mention uh, to the task force members uh, that the National Academy of Sciences Committee on Independent Scientific Review on Everglades Restoration Project, also known as CISREP, is wrapping up their current engagement for the next reporting cycle uh, that will be concluded this fall. Uh, the 10th biennial report should be finalized, should emphasize, emphasize, should be finalized and released prior to the next task force meeting. So um, you did a great job mentioning about the Coral Reef Task Force Coordination Team and we'll probably be bringing that or the state will be uh, bringing that back uh, up over the summer and possibly for the next meeting. And um, I think you captured it all and we'll be working uh, very, very hard uh, to address the invasive species uh, um, direction I will, I will offer that um, knowing that there was gonna be some outcome uh, of this meeting, um, we have, a, a, there's a working group and science coordination group scheduled uh, for this Thursday to begin an aggressive schedule uh, to address this so we're prepared for the October uh, meeting. So uh, that's all I have. Okay, excellent. Well, happy to open it up for any other closing comments. Yes, Mr. Bergeron, please. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. You done a beautiful job for all of us. Thank you very much. And I would, uh, next meeting we have here in South Florida, uh, I, I would like to host a tour where maybe you can see and learn uh, firsthand uh, in the beautiful Everglades. And um, I'd like to work with you all on that. I think it would help a lot of our members that's not intricately involved uh, to all of the uh, different uh, projects that are going on and, and the importance, I think it would help a lot of our members out that's not closely connected like a lot of us down here uh, that's in the Everglades and involved. So uh, keep that in mind and I'm very honored to to, to be on the task force with all of you and long live the Everglades. Thank you very much. Michael Connor. There we go. Thanks, Madam Chair. I just wanted to wrap up by um, noting that while we started with a lot of good news stories about partnership, the resources in place, uh, the projects that we've completed and that are well underway uh, during the course of the meeting. There's obviously been a description of the ongoing challenges to restoration uh, overall that we've uh, got to address as well as specific issues. And some of those uh, were raised at the start. Mr. Duncan certainly raised some of those from the tribe's perspective. Um, and so uh, I just want to acknowledge those challenges and the hard work ahead of us and the commitment, particularly uh, Army Civil Works and working with all of you, but to particularly the tribes. Uh, we are engaged in uh, discussions and uh, activities to try and move forward, not just in the planning process, but address some of the specific issues raised. And we're committed to do that. And uh, uh, from uh, our folks on the ground to folks through headquarters, uh, we'll be very active in all these 
Everglades issues. So thanks to everybody for the input and reminding us of those challenges ahead. Uh, thanks to the partnerships uh, that are uh, making us very strong out there. Uh, and thanks, Madam Chair, to you and your team and our new vice chair uh, for leading this effort. Thank you, Mr. Connor. Thank you. Madam Chair. Nicole, yes, sir. Go ahead, Nicole, thanks. Thank you, Madam Chair, for your fine execution of your very first meeting and to all the task force members for their ongoing dedication. I know, one down, well done, well done. Um, I would also, of course, like to extend my gratitude to Adam Gelber and his team at the Office of Everglades Restoration Initiatives for their coordination of this virtual meeting um, and everything else they're doing to keep us on track. It was great to see you again, um, to meet uh, several new members, and with each meeting I continue to learn uh, about the work um, that we are doing and to see opportunities where NOAA and the Department of Commerce can contribute um, it is really clear um, that we're making good progress from the beginning of this meeting all the way to the end with the presentation um, so important on invasive species. Um, I would like to express our appreciation for the establishment of a coral working group. Um, we have much to do and coral health has to be a part of that. Um, and I'm just very excited um, to get to know all of you more. I hope to see you later in DC um, and then really uh, Florida soon, please. Um, and um, yeah, more to come. Good to see everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, we have an additional comment. Jeanette, Janine. Janine, yeah. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to, I, I believe that Radhika had to leave. And so I wanted to say on behalf of EPA, how much we appreciated the meeting and the work that went into preparing for the meeting. Uh, we always find these very informative and certainly um, appreciate the progress that's being made in restoring the Everglades. Um, it is a critical uh, water resource for us. And uh, we very much appreciate working with all of the partners that are represented here today on this effort. So thank you very much. And um, I know that Radhika looks forward to uh, joining you in uh, DC in October. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if there aren't any more comments, let's call it a day. Really, really appreciate everybody's participation and ongoing work. Thank you all very much. Adam, any other closing requirements or thoughts? Oh, we'll be in touch and working with our partners to advance uh, the, the task force discussion here. Um, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll be planning for a robust, plan for a robust long day in uh, the Stuart Udall building uh, in, in October. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. So long. Thank you. Bye.